Hi listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's interview is with someone whose views are distinctive enough to have been given a name of their own, the Hansonian Perspective. It's likely to be entertaining to most people who are subscribed to the show. And while you may have heard other interviews about Robin Hansen's recent book, don't be put off by that. We cover plenty of original ground here. Before that, though, I wanted to suggest another podcast that you might like subscribing to, and that show is Econ Talk. It's the first podcast I started listening to nine years ago now, and it still brightens every Monday morning for me. The format is similar to this one, hour-long interviews with experts on particular topics, which range from economics to war to how to run a business. The uniting theme being thinking carefully about the social world. The show has had a lot of Nobel Prize winners on, but personally, my favorite episodes are usually with people I've never heard of. Some guests you probably have heard of, though, are Christopher Hitchens, Milton Friedman, and Thomas Piketty. The host, Russ Roberts, has distinctive political views, but is unfailingly polite and often invites on guests with alternative views. It's really a model of how to have good conversations. There are about 600 hours worth of episodes in the archives, so if you haven't listened to it at all yet, it can provide 25 days of straight entertainment, assuming you can go without any sleep. That number might feel a bit overwhelming, so I've made a list of my favorite 75 episodes, which I'll link to in the blog post in the show notes. And without further ado, I bring you Robin Hansen. Today, I'm speaking with Robin Hansen. Robin is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. Robin received a Bachelor of Science in Physics from UC Irvine in 1981, but then switched fields and went on to finish his PhD in Social Science from Caltech in 1997. Statistician Nate Silver described Robin the following way. He is clearly not a man afraid to challenge the conventional wisdom. Instead, Hansen writes a blog called Overcoming Bias, in which he presses readers to consider which cultural taboos, ideological beliefs, or misaligned incentives might constrain them from making optimal decisions. Robin's unusual views range across a pretty wide range of fields, including psychology, politics, and futurology. And his latest book is The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Robin. Great to be here. And the book is co-authored with Kevin Simler. Absolutely. <laughs> you can't forget that. Uh, so we plan to focus a fair bit on lessons from Elephant in the Brain. But first, let's find out a bit more about how you got where you are today. You're pretty unusual for finishing your PhD at the age of 38 in a pretty different field uh, than the one you did your undergraduate work in, and then still going on to have a successful academic career. Uh, how did you do that? And, and what were you doing in between your, your undergrad and your PhD? I got lucky, I think I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I got in, started out in undergraduate in engineering, and then I switched to physics. And then I started in graduate school in philosophy of science, but then I switched back to physics. And so then I got a master's in physics and philosophy of science in 1984 from University of Chicago. And then I got stars in my eyes reading about cool things happening in artificial intelligence and the web out in Silicon Valley. And so I went out to Silicon Valley, and I got a job doing AI, and on the side played with the web with Xanadu Group. And I did that for nine years at Lockheed and NASA. And then I finally started my PhD at the age of 34 with two kids age zero and two at Caltech. Cool. And, and what's, what's Xana do? That was a, like an alternative to the World Wide Web, right? Or a different way of organizing it? Yeah, so it was inspired by Ted Nelson, sort of, who's the visionary leader idea guy. And uh, they had a vision for what the web could be, and they were working to make it. And their main failing was that they uh, tried to add too many features and insisted on all these features. And so then Tim Berners-Lee finally just delivered a very simple version of the web and that took off. And that's the one we have today. Right, So, but I did learn uh, some things about futurism. (laughs) Some people later have said the World Wide Web was just one of those things that no one could have foreseen. And of course, there I was in a group of people who did foresee it. And I also know that uh, they didn't get much out of it. (laughs) That is, they didn't get much personal benefit from foreseeing the future. And so it suggests both that it's possible to foresee the future and not that rewarded, which may explain why it's not done as much as you might think. So what made you switch from physics to economics and social science? Well, I noticed that in physics and in uh, engineering and, and in software engineering, people were eager for innovations that improve things. And it was hard to find things that could improve things very much. And I started to read about social science, and it seemed to me there were these really large innovations that were just there for the picking. And either I was a genius or it was really easy picking, but whatever it was, I wanted to switch over to uh, try to gain those advantages. And what I eventually realized 
uh, after I had switched was that the reason it's so easy to find apparently large improvements is because they're almost never adopted. <laughs> Which they just sit there, you, you know, decade after decade, not being used. And that is a puzzle that uh, the elephant in the brain is in part intended to address. So do you think the reason that these things aren't adopted is because they're actually not as good ideas as, as they seem to be at, at first glance or because they're like not in the interests of the people who are, who are most powerful under the current system? Neither. <laughs> so, so some people would say, well, it's just impossible to find improvements in social science or to prove that they're improvements uh, because social science just isn't rigorous enough. I think that's just wrong. Uh, we can uh, do theory and lab experiments and even field experiments to show that, that things are improvements. I think the actual problem is that uh, social scientists and policy analysts start from the assumption that the thing people say they are trying to get is the thing they are actually trying to get. So when people try to study education and how to improve education, they take the usual story that education is about learning the material so that you can be a more useful worker or citizen, and they study how you could learn the material faster, better. And when they come up with those answers, uh, they offer them to the world, and the world's not very interested. And my best explanation is that the world kind of knows that it isn't really at school to learn the material. <laughs> That's what we say, but it's not really why we're there. And similarly, through a lot of other institutional areas in politics and medicine, we say we go to the doctor to get well, and uh, people offer better institutions for getting well, and we aren't interested, pl plausibly because we kind of know that that's not why we actually go to the doctor. Mm. Okay, well, let's, that brings us to, to the book, uh, Elephant in the Brain. The subtitle is Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. Uh, what hidden motives uh, are you talking about? Well, as we just said, the example that uh, in education your motive isn't to learn the material, or uh, when you go to the doctor your motive isn't to get well, primarily, and the hidden motives are the actual motive. So now, how, do, how could I know what the hidden motives are, you might ask? <laughs> so the plan here uh, through the book is in each area, we identify the usual story, then we collect a set of puzzles that don't make sense from the point of view of the usual story. Strange empirical patterns. And then we offer an alternative motive that makes a lot more sense of those empirical patterns. And then we suggest that is a stronger motive than the one we usually say. Now, just to be clear, almost every, every area of human life is complicated. And there's a lot of people with a lot of different details. And so, of course, almost every possible motive shows up in almost every area of human life. So we can't be talking about the only motive. And so the usual motive does actually apply sometimes. Actually, you could think of the an analogy to the excuse that the dog ate my homework. It only works because sometimes dogs eat homework. We don't say the dragon ate my homework. That wouldn't fly. <laughs> so the usual story is part of the story. It's just a smaller part than we like to admit. And what we're going to call the hidden motive the real motive is a bigger part of the story, but it's still not the only part. Mm. But you don't mean people are kind of maliciously lying about their motivations. You think that they, they actually believe the, the standard story in, in most cases, but they, they're just mistaken about why they're doing what they're doing. Well, actually, there's just a huge range of variation in who's aware of what. We individually vary from moment to moment, depending on whether we're on the public stage or talking privately to people. We vary in terms of which topics we are invested a lot in. So for most of us, there's some area of life that's the most precious and sacred to us. And we're going to be the most resistant to believing that our motives there aren't the high-minded motives we like to think. But in somebody else's area, you might be more willing. So if you're an atheist, you're more willing to believe that those religious people <laughs> have a hidden motive uh, that isn't what they say. Uh, whereas if you're religious, that'll be harder to swallow. Whereas maybe if you're a teacher, it's a little bit hard to believe that people aren't learning things. <laughs> exactly. And so, and so, and it also varies again by how public we are. So, so there's a sense in which when we're on stage, when we write a letter of application to school or a politician making a speech, those are the contexts where we most have to pander to the thing everybody wants to hear and expects to hear from us. And if we're pr talking at a bar or privately to a lover, <laughs> then we might be more honest about our other motives. Okay, so, so the broad claim is that you know, many things in the social world aren't, aren't quite what they seem to be or what people say they are. Well, let, let's, let's be specific, though. What, what, if people aren't going to school to learn, uh, what, what is education all about? So our book, the first third goes over the general theory of why it might be plausible that we would have hidden motives, and then the last two thirds goes over, over 10 different areas of life, and one of those areas of education. So each 
area has a chapter, and we can't go into enormous detail, of course, because it's just one chapter in a book. So our chapter on education is taken from my colleague Brian Kaplan's book, whole treatment on this, called The Case Against Education. And there, the usual story is that we're learning the material, and some puzzles with that start from the fact that actually most people don't remember most of what they quote-unquote learn, <laughs> and most of what they do remember isn't actually very useful, yet people who are, get, say, get a college degree and become a bartender make more than people who have only a high school degree and become a bartender. We do get paid more on average for more years of school, but the last year of high school and the last year of college get paid three times as much as other years, uh, even though you don't learn more in the last year. I lived near Stanford uh, when I was going to Lockheed and NASA, and I often would sit in on Stanford classes, and I didn't need to apply or register. I could just go get the best, one of the best learning in the world for free merely by walking in and sitting down. You might think uh, they would be very careful to not allow that sort of thing, but no, nobody cares, and, and professors tend to be flattered. In fact, one of them gave me a letter of recommendation on the basis of my uh, performance in a class that I didn't register for, or even I wasn't even officially in the school. And so that's a puzzle from the point of view of, of people you know, mainly going to school to learn, because uh, you would think I'm getting all this benefit for free. Uh, so there are even more puzzles than the ones I've listed, but that should be enough to make it clear that there are some puzzles with the story that we go to school to learn. Hmm. So what do you think better explains this kind of behavior? So uh, Brian's story, which I certainly think is a big part of it, is that we are there to show off. We are there to show how smart and conscientious and conformist we are. In our book, we add to that the idea that you might also, of course, uh, you can meet mates there, it can be babysitting, you can adapt to modern workplace practices, uh, the government can use it for propaganda. These are also some of the functions. The main one is to show off, I agree, and we do learn some things in school, it's not like it's zero. Uh, again, it's like the dog ate the homework, it works because it does sometimes happen <laughs> as an excuse, but it's just not the main thing. So in the case of education, if, if you're right, wh why do we have to pretend that we're going to education to learn rather than to, you know, separate smarter people from, from less smart people? Uh, why, why couldn't we just be upfront about that? That is an excellent question. <laughs> That's in a sense the, the big theoretical puzzle here. All of the things that we say in the book people are doing are all reasonable things to do. They aren't crazy things to do. And so you might think, why not just know that that's what you're doing? And that's where we get to the idea of norms and uh, norm enforcement and evading norm enforcement, uh, which we spend a lot of the first third of the book discussing. So compared to other animals, humans had norms. That is, uh, other animals just have usual behaviors, but humans have rules about what the usual behaviors are supposed to be. And we have the rule that if you see someone violating the rule, you're supposed to do something about it. You're supposed to tell people and then try to work to uh, make them stop. And that means that uh, we are constantly watching out for what we are doing and what other people are doing to see if they're violating rules. Uh, humans had much larger social groups than other primates. Uh, most other primates, if they have a group that's too large, it just fragments and they just can't manage it politically. But humans were able to manage much larger groups uh, and that allowed us to do a lot of things other primates couldn't. And the standard story is that uh, we have the largest brains of all because we had the most complicated social worlds. And so the main environment for our ancestors was not the rain or the, the prey or predators, it was each other. And so we have these big brains to think about each other all the time. And since humans had these norms as a big part of how we managed and kept the peace, then we were constantly thinking about, am I perhaps violating a norm at the moment? <laughs> or are you violating a norm? And uh, in fact, our brain devoted a big fraction of its processing to constantly keeping track of what we're doing and trying to, to manage a good story about what we were doing. So a lot of our norms are in terms of motives. That is, it's okay if I hit you accidentally, but it's not okay if I hit you on purpose. And so that means we wanna keep track of our motives and, and keep track of what sort of plausible motives we could ascribe to other people. And that's why we care a lot about our motives. And in fact, your conscious mind is more plausibly a press secretary. <laughs> You're not the president or the king or the, or the CEO. You aren't in charge. You aren't actually making the decisions, the conscious part of your mind at least. You are there to make up a good explanation for what's going on so that you can avoid the accusation that you're violating norms. Right. Okay. So basically, you've got your subconscious, uh, you're claiming, is figuring out what is the best thing for, for you to do that serves your interests. And then kind of your conscious mind believes that it's doing things for a different reason so that it can compellingly 
tell other people that that's why that that, that was your actual motivation. Right. There's a set of experiments now 50 years old on the split brain patients, and that suggests that we are really quite prone to making up explanations. <laughs> so basically, these patients had the two halves of their brain split apart, and one half of the brain uh, has attached to one eye, one ear, one arm, one leg. And you can set it up so you can talk to one brain and then ask it to do something like stand up. And then you can talk to the other brain and say, why did you do that? In such a way that the second brain doesn't really know what the first brain was doing. And if you say, why did you do that? The honest answer should be, I don't know. <laughs> you were talking to the other brain. <laughs> uh, but that's not what it does. Actually, it very consistently just makes up an explanation as necessary to try to attribute uh, its behavior. So it might say, I wanted to get a Coke, even though it really doesn't know. So that's the kind of brain you have. It's just always ready to make up an explanation for what you're doing, even when it doesn't know. Hmm. And you think this desire to confabulate explanations is because it's socially advantageous to do so? Yes. Yeah, so we have huge brains mainly to deal with our complicated social world. And we have the biggest brains of all. And the main element of our social world that could get us into trouble was norm violations, breaking rules. And apparently human minds have this just part of their brain. It's, it's called the default network. Unless we're doing something else, it's just always ruminating about what we've been doing and why and uh, trying to make an explanation. This is the thing you're trying to shut off when you're meditating. It's so hard to shut off because your mind is just always doing this, tracking what you're doing and why and making sure you have a good story. Which, which suggests that it's extremely important for your survival. Right, because it's very expensive. Okay, but we could have our minds designed such that we're aware of what our actual motivations are, but then we tell other people that we're doing them for you know, more high-minded reasons. Uh, why, why can't we be designed that way? Human brain is not very modular. If it were very modular, then it would be more possible to lie with a straight face. But in fact, uh, when one part of our brain has one agenda going on and, and one set of feelings, uh, it tends to just infect the whole brain and produce affects all of our behavior. It affects our tone of voice, uh, the slant of our head, whether we're sh shaking our knees. And because of that, it's actually pretty hard to give one big part of our brain one set of beliefs and attitudes and other parts really different ones. Actors really have to spend a long time learning to act, and it's hard. Hmm. So for that reason, it's a lot easier to, to pretend if you actually believe the thing. So our brain has been designed such that we, we actually sincerely believe whatever we want to present to other people. I mean, salespeople know this. I mean, the, the most reliable way to be a good salesperson is to actually believe in your crappy product. <laughs> yeah. And so evolution has designed us to, to believe whatever is useful to believe. Right. Mainly because we just don't have a very modular brain. Things just leak all over the place. Okay, so let's let's come back to education. If, if I'm involved in uh, the education system and I come up and say, you know, I don't think that the education system is explained by trying to learn information that's useful. I think it's just a matter of separating smart people from less smart people. Uh, like, wh why why do we need to have a have a different story uh, for that? What, why why would I lose out if I claimed that? Well, uh, each of us again is trying to present a, a high-minded image and an image that's not violating norms. So humans have a strong norm against bragging. And we actually do a lot with an eye to showing off, with an eye to creating a favorable impression. And that all of that violates the bragging norm. We, we can still do it. We just have to pretend we're doing something else, which we do. And so uh, you can't just say, I'm going to school to show off. I'm trying to show you all how smart and conscientious they are, because then you're bragging. <laughs> uh, and I guess for, for teachers would it, or for, you know, university lecturers, would it, would it be hard for them to justify, you know, all of the funding that they're getting if, if they say that all that we're doing is like testing people and how smart they are? Plausibly, but I don't think that's the main thing. Uh, in almost every area, these people who supply a product will try to spin it in the highest minded way they can, but they will mostly cave to whatever the customer's perception is. So uh, if, the, if the customers don't believe car repair is, is the most holy, noble profession, <laughs> then uh, the car repair people just will keep quiet about that, even if they th believe it privately. <laughs> They're not really going to push that on the customers. It's when the customers are willing to believe that and even prefer that, that the suppliers will also go along. I suppose, so, you know, if I'd studied philosophy or classics or something like that, and then people ask me, oh, you know, why did you do that? And I said, oh, I mean, it certainly wasn't to learn anything useful. It was all completely you know, useless, all of the information that I learned. I was just doing it to show how smart I was. People would judge me negatively because I'd be bragging and also just suggesting, I guess, that I'm not actually interested in the topic at all. I'm, I'm only doing it to you know, get, get one up on other people. It's very mercenary. It's very manipulative. Uh, Conniving. Exactly. 
Okay. And so kind of everyone is leaning in the direction of claiming, oh no, it's because this information is really useful. And then that over time creates this kind of false consciousness about the, the purpose of education. Yeah. So in almost all of our areas of life, we're, we're trying to look for a, as high-minded a motive as we can that's plausible, uh, you know, it, at least to some degree, and also avoids violating norms. So education is one of them, but uh, listeners might not be convinced by that. So, so let's, let's go through a couple of different examples. Uh, what's, what's the story that you have about religion? So our story is just cribbed from the standard social science of religion literature. Uh, the usual story about religion, if you will, is that people have these beliefs about the supernatural and, and God and other things like that. And these beliefs uh, suggest that they have to follow certain behavior that the God might have commanded. And that explains their behavior. They're, they're doing these things because they believe God told them to. Uh, that's the straightforward explanation that a religious person might give you. Now, in fact, most religion in history didn't actually uh, focus very much on beliefs. In the ancient world, it was mostly that you, you needed to do the regular rituals that you were supposed to do, and what you believed wasn't very important. Uh, but even then, you might ask, well, why do you do these rituals? And you might just say, because everybody else does, because <laughs> this is what you're supposed to do, which isn't much of an explanation. And uh, there's a lot of puzzles, of course, from the point of view of this theory. The most obvious puzzle is that religious people actually win in a lot of ways, very consistently. Religious people make more money, get married more, have less crime, they live longer, they use fewer drugs, they have more friends. Uh, so making you know, a, a mistake or, or adopting strange beliefs seems an odd way to achieve these very practical ends, but religious people consistently win in these ways. And so that's a puzzle that needs to be explained. Right. And so why do you think people are, people are actually getting involved in religion? So the standard story in the social science of religion is that religion helps bond communities together. That uh, when you are asked to follow rules about diet and dress and to believe strange things and you do that, you show your community that you are willing to pay a price to be part of them. And they can trust you more and then rely on you more. And in fact, religions that demand more of their members do in fact trust each other more and are able to insure each other more, say, against uh, losing their job or health or things like that. Are there any specific characteristics um, that are common to many religions that are, that are better explained by, by that motivation? Well, the, most religions have relatively arbitrary restrictions and rules that, that don't seem to have much else function. Uh, in addition, they, they spend time in um, rituals together that they could you know, better spend that time doing something else. And so there, there are a lot of common features in most religions, yes. So I think... One of the most common kind of hidden motivations that I think most of us would accept that we have to some extent but don't like talking about is just that we, we like spending time with and making friends with people who are, you know, successful and smart and attractive um, and potentially, you know, have, have a lot of money. And most of us, uh, you know, don't say, oh, I'm doing, I, I want to befriend those people because it's going to be of practical value to me because they might be able to invest in my company or they might be able to, to help with my project because they're particularly talented. Uh, we're more inclined to say, oh, it's because they're charming or, or they're particularly funny or they're just enjoyable to hang out with. Uh, but it's uh, interesting how our motivation to spend time with people does seem to really strongly coincide with how useful they are to have as kind of allies socially. Yeah, that's not one of our chapters in our book. We do go over 10 areas, but I think you could probably do another 10 or 20 chapters like we did in our book. And I'm hoping we can inspire other people to do that sort of thing. I'm hoping we are opening up a new area of way of looking at the world that people will join in on. But yes, this is one of them. We, when we ask, why do you like these friends? Uh, we don't tend to talk in terms of, well, they help me get a job, they, they help me get sex, they, they might help me when I need to move. Uh, we, we don't want to talk about those things. We don't want to admit those sorts of uh, motives that we would use them. So we, we say we like them. And of course, we do, we, of course, we do like them. It's just that we don't think very much about why. A similar thing is about fun. When, when you say, why do you do something? And because it's fun, if you step back and you realize, well, that's just not much of an explanation at all. Uh, that's a feeling you have at the moment. Uh, no doubt, from your personal point of view, that's enough of a reason to do it, but it doesn't explain why you have that feeling. Why is this fun? Similarly, it doesn't explain, you, I like this person, fine, but why do you like them? I mean, what causal process produces your liking them? How is it that after millions of years, evolution honed your senses to want to like this sort of person? So another chapter was about medicine. Uh, what, uh, what are the unusual things going on uh, with people's use of healthcare? So medicine is probably the chapter that will surprise the most people because at least in our society, people are pretty uh, sensitive to medicine. They, they find it as a pretty sacred thing. So the usual story about medicine is that we go to the doctor uh, to get well, and we push other people, of course, to go to the doctor so they can get well. 
And there's a bunch of puzzles with this explanation. The biggest one that stands you right in the face is that people who get more medicine aren't on average healthier. That is, we have variations across regions, like as nations and states and counties, and the places where people get more medicine on average, i.e. spend more money or have more visits, those places do not on average have healthier people. We also have randomized experiments where we've given some people cheaper medicine and other people more expensive medicine, and the people who faced a lower price chose to get more medicine, but they were not on average healthier. And that's a big puzzle because we spend in the US 18% of GDP on medicine. And there are a lot of other things that we know have big, strong correlations with health that we are much less interested in personally or policy-wise. That includes exercise, uh, air quality, sleep, social status, uh, nutrition. There, there's just a whole wide range of things that have big effects. And I t I've taught health economics many years. And if you asked people about whether they want to change policy to promote these other things, they, they just don't think there's much of a priority there. But if you talk about medicine, they are really all over that. And they think medicine is really important. Mm. So kind of uh, it outrages people when someone doesn't get access to health care, but people aren't similarly uh, infuriated by the fact that some people don't exercise as much or don't have as good opportunities to exercise. Right. Or have subsidized exercise, et cetera. Mm. Even though exercise potentially has a much larger effect than extra health care. Absolutely. Much larger effect. Mm. We have other puzzles that uh, people are surprisingly uninterested in information about the quality of medicine. People have a keeping up with the Joneses effect where uh, they tend to spend more medicine when people around them spend more. And an explanation is uh, with the analogy, first of all, of a parent kissing the child's boo-boo. A child scrapes their knee and cries, and the parent comes over and says they're there and kisses the boo-boo, and the child calms down and feels comforted. We know there's no medical effect there, but it still works to comfort the child. And another analogy is with Valentine's chocolates. So f for many people uh, on Valentine's, there's a tradition of showing they care about people by buying them chocolates. When they do that, they don't ask themselves, how hungry is the other person I'm giving the chocolates to? How many chocolates do they need? What they ask is, how much chocolates do I need to buy in order to distinguish myself from someone who doesn't care as much as I do? And when they think about the quality of the chocolate, the signals of quality, they know to look for s common shared signals of quality. If they have a private signal about the quality, that's not going to affect their choice very much, either as a receiver or the giver, because they know the other person doesn't see that signal. In order to judge the generosity, you have to guess what could somebody have plausibly known about the quality. And these are analogous to medicine. In medicine, we give as much medicine as it takes to show that we care, even when a lot of the extra medicine isn't very useful. But if we gave less, it would seem like we cared less. And we aren't very interested in the quality of medicine, at least when it's private signals about the quality of medicine. We're much more interested in common shared signals of quality. Mm. So, so with the Valentine's Day chocolates, so there's a couple of odd things. So if I manage to get a really good deal on them, so I managed to get some, some really nice chocolates for a very little money, uh, I probably wouldn't want to tell them that, even though in other cases that would be good, right? Because it, it's not so much that you're trying to get a great deal because you want them to enjoy the chocolates. It's about the kind of the, the expense to you. Exactly. And, and you probably should, <laughs> if you've got a friend who is about to undergo surgery, you might say, hey, I've got you this really great deal on surgery in Mexico. It's a third the price. <laughs> the, the, the plane fare will easily cover the savings. They may not appreciate your generosity there. Yeah. Another thing is we, we tend to buy gifts that are potentially much more extravagant than what the person would, would ever buy normally. Uh, again, because the point isn't that, that they really enjoy the taste of chocolate, though they might like it. Uh, the reason you get the, the, the more expensive and extravagant chocolates is to show that you're willing to spend the money. Right. And so we can use this as cues to figure out what areas of life are actually there as gifts, as ways to show that we care about each other rather than uh, more functionally for the direct benefits. And so your claim is that people buy too much medicine and potentially that they gift too much medicine because they want to show to people who are sick that they really care about them a lot, even if the medicine doesn't help. Right. So there's two sides of this. Uh, you might want to make sure a friend or associate gets medicine, and you might want to publicly show that you were helping them to do that, uh, driving them to the doctor, visiting them, paying for it, etc., in order to show them that you care. And on the other side, they want you to show that you care and want many people to see that they are cared for. Uh, so for example, on Valentine's, if you don't actually have someone to give you chocolates, you might buy some yourself and leave it on the desk at the office. <laughs> <laughs> Because you don't want to seem like the sort of person that nobody cares about. Right. 
I guess I guess you really don't want to be seen as the kind of person who buys chocolates for themselves to make it look like <laughs> other people care about you. But if, but if you can get away with it, <laughs> exactly. So just to be clear for the audience, this this view that at least in America, getting extra health care isn't that useful isn't some like peculiar Robin Hanson view. This is kind of just the standard view that that health economists have, right? Well, the standard view is certainly that we can see very little effect on the margin of more spending on medicine on health. And we see the standard view that we see a lot of other things that are much bigger. Uh, I did a, a Cato Unbound forum about 10 years ago where my starting essay was cut medicine in half, and a number of prominent health uh, economists uh, responded there. Uh, none of them disagreed with my basic factual claims about the correlation of health and medicine and other things. Well, still many of them were reluctant to uh, give up on many medicine. They said, well, yes, on average it doesn't help, but some of it must be useful, and uh, we shouldn't cut anything until we figure out what the useful parts are. And, and I make the analogy of that with a monkey trap. So in many parts of the world, there are monkeys who run around, and one you might want to eat one. And if to do that, you need to trap one. And a common way to trap a monkey is you take a gourd that is uh, a big container that's empty, and you put a nut on the inside of that gourd, <laughs> And the monkey will reach into the gourd and put his fist around the nut and try to pull his hand out. And because the, and the mouth is too small to get his hand out. And he will not let go of that nut. <laughs> <laughs> is that actually true? Is, is that, that's not just a metaphor. That's literally true. Yes. Yeah, he will, in fact, he, he will, in fact, get caught and eaten <laughs> because he will not be willing to let go of that nut. Uh, and this is a way to trap and eat a monkey. Now, uh, I don't know, think this is how curious George was caught, but it could have been. <laughs> So, so this is you know a sad thing, basically, uh, if you won't let go of that nut. But I think that's also true. My colleague, Brian Kaplan, again, at the moment, has this book, The Case Against Education, and he's getting a similar response. Uh, people tend to agree with him. Yes, we don't learn very much. Um, there's not you know much actual uh, learning going on in school, or we don't remember very much of it. And he says, well, let's cut education a lot. And uh, they say, no, no, no. Uh, let's, you know, wait until we can figure out what parts are useful and then, you know, focus more on those. But we shouldn't cut anything which again, I think would be the monkey trap. Okay, so I want to I wanna push back a little bit on these. So one thing is, although I, I agree with the evidence that you know, a, bit of, a bit of extra healthcare uh, or a bit less doesn't really seem to make that much difference to health. You know, when, when I go to the doctor, I don't personally feel like I'm going there to be cared for by someone. Um, and I don't, I just find it hard to believe that that's just a delusion on my part. Like when, when I go to the doctor, you know, it's usually because I want to get cured for some specific thing. And if it doesn't work, then I really feel like I've basically wasted my time. Am I just uh, delude, deluding myself or is it perhaps just that the, the, the health issues that I have, you know, aren't so serious that I'm kind of bedridden and, and, I, and I feel the need to make sure that, that it seems like people are still caring for me and, and, you know, won't let me, won't let me starve? Well, if you take the analog of starving... The time when you notice that you really, really like food is when you don't have enough. Uh, okay, if you've got plenty of food, but it's not very tasty, then you'll eat it periodically, but and it just won't be something you think very much about. Uh, the same for sex, for example. I mean, people who get enough sex, uh, it's not really an obsession with them. They, they can focus on other things. It's people who don't get enough who, who get really obsessed with it. And similarly, if you, if you get enough medicine whenever you want it, it's there. Uh, you might not feel that there's much of a strain or issue, but you should just ask yourself what would happen if you couldn't get it. Say you were hiking off in a distant place and you had some symptoms and for several weeks you couldn't get anybody to look at them and they seem to be getting worse. N now ask yourself, how stressed would you be then? Yeah. Or maybe what if I was just someone who didn't have any friends and I didn't feel socially secure that people would take care of me if I was sick, then, 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 going, then going to the doctor might be very comforting because then it would show that someone did care about me. Right. That is, if, if, the, if you were stressed, there would be somebody who would uh, watch out for you and then reassure you. Yeah, interesting. So, so an alternative explanation for, for many of these cases would just be that, uh, you know, people aren't that smart. They don't like read these papers about, uh, you know, how useful is more marginal education or, or more medicine that they're not studying the randomized controlled trials. And so they're just kind of making a mistake. Uh, they, they think that medicine is more useful than it is. You know, maybe doctors are very good at, you know, marketing their services and they, they overstate how valuable it is because it's because it's good for good for their profession. Uh, can't people just be kind of making making errors here? And wh why do we have to assume that it's because of these like these hidden motivations? Well, a simple theory is that somebody is going to the doctor to get well or to show off. A slightly more complicated theory is that they are trying to do that, but they are ignorant about a lot of things, and therefore they make a lot of mistakes. So uh, these modified error-prone theories uh, have a lot in common with the error-free theories, uh, but they're just going to have a lot more variety and variance around them. 
Uh, so if you aren't very sure about the effectiveness of any particular medical treatment, say, uh, but you still want to get well, then there'll just be a lot more noise in your choices. You will sometimes choose things that are not effective and other times not choose things that are effective. On average, though, you wouldn't choose too much medicine. You might choose the wrong kinds, but uh, it would be unlikely that you would consistently choose too much medicine if you are just making mistakes about which medicine is effective. I, I agree that's true about specific treatments, but, but couldn't we all just be kind of uh, fooled by uh, perhaps, okay, so pe people, people get sick and then they go to the doctor and then they tend to get better. And a lot of that is just because of regression to the mean, because you go to the doctor when you're uh, you know, most ill. And then in general, when people are like much more ill than usual, they, t they tend to get better over time. Perhaps we're all just getting kind of conned by this statistical illusion that uh, you know, med medicine seems more useful than it is because people tend to get better after seeking treatment. Uh, is, it, is it possible to see you have like illusions like that that cause everyone to, to be mistaken about the value of these different services? Well, that theory would apply to many other things besides medicine. Uh, that theory would predict that we would way overspend on pretty much all advisors about anything that we would be anxious about. Uh, anytime you're anxious about your romance, uh, you would go to a romantic advisor who would uh, reassure you and do something, and then later things would get a little better, and so you'd be doing that a lot. So this theory, in a sense, predicts too much. It predicts that we do too much of a whole wide range of things, not just medicine. Mm. And you don't think that that's true? No, I don't think it is. I think we're actually pretty reasonably skeptical about most things. We don't actually hire romantic advisors very much, even if we are often stressed about our romance. <laughs> So basically here, here, your approach for, for showing these hidden motives is to look at a whole bunch of different odd things that people do and then say that their actual behavior is better explained by these hidden motivations that you might expect them to, to have anyway, uh, given how humans evolved. And I suppose that your, your defense would be that people might challenge you know, any one of these. They might not buy the story on religion or education. They might think there's a different explanation. But you think as a whole, it kind of paints a compelling picture. Right, because each of us is going to be very sensitive in one area that we are especially sacred about. Uh, I can't really expect to convince you of all 10 of these areas, for example, but if you believe eight out of them, then you should believe the case that there's a lot of hidden motives going on, and that's the main thing to make. If there are a lot of hidden motives going on here, that says that we're just misunderstanding a lot of human behavior right from the get-go, and a lot of our policy analysis is just going wrong, seriously wrong. Do you try uh, to take a different approach to justifying it, saying that this is kind of what we should expect even before we look at any of these specific cases? Because, you know, humans evolve to you know, be good at reproducing themselves. And sometimes that's going to involve, you know, pretending uh, to have different motivations than the ones that they do. And of course, it, you know, it's not going to be obvious because no one's going to want to want to fess up to this. Do you, do you think that like people should expect this to be true uh, even before they look at the specific cases that you're bringing up? They should expect it to be plausible, but that's not quite the same as being true. So the first third of our book, again, is, is to try to make plausible that we would often have hidden motives. But even people who tend to believe everything we say in the first third of the book, they don't tend to have the beliefs that we describe here about our hidden motives in education and medicine, etc. They can still be quite surprised by that, each of these specific examples. So the, the, just the general idea that we would opportunistically fool ourselves if that were an advantage is plausible, but you still might not believe there are that many opportunities to fool ourselves. You might think these things are just so obvious uh, that people self-deceive about, say, whether their spouse is having an affair or they self-deceive about whether they're an especially good driver or some other things like that. But you might not think there was much point in self-deceiving about the point of going to school, the point of going to the doctor or the point of voting. So we really have to go through the details in order to persuade you of that. Mm. Another potential uh, knock on the evidence you're providing is just that it's a, it seems a bit unfalsifiable because you've got all these different cases where people's behavior seems a little bit strange and then you're coming up with a story that you think better explains it. But, you know, in many cases, couldn't you come up with kind of a signaling explanation for the exact reverse? So let's say that people didn't spend very much uh, money on medicine and, and they were very reluctant to go to the doctor. Couldn't you then say, oh, this is because they, they don't want to seem weak to other people. They don't want to seem like they're sick. And so th this explains why we're spending so little on, uh, little on medicine. So isn't there isn't there the potential whenever you're kind of trying to reinterpret why people are saying what they're saying or why they're doing what they're doing in a way that's very not not literal that you could get a lot of false positives where kind of you can you can explain anything through this sort of signaling or, or hidden motivation approach? The social world is large and complex, and you have to be focused on explaining overall patterns. You kind of have to give up on explaining any particular person and what they're doing at this moment and why. Uh, but we have a lot of people with a lot of data and. Uh, they, it isn't all random. There are a lot of patterns in what people do. And yes, if you take a simple theory 
uh, without much structure, it can almost, almost explain everything. So, for example, the error theory can explain just about everything. Whatever we were trying to do, we could be accidentally doing something else instead <laughs> because we were mistaken. Uh, so, in a sense, the error theory is too broad. The conformity theory is also a bit too broad. Many people have a simple conformity theory that we just do whatever we're supposed to do that everybody else is doing, and that's why we do things. But of course, that could explain almost any pattern of what we're doing. Mm. You then have to explain what why things started to be the way that they are. Right. And so it's the details that matter. Yes, that's, that's the crucial point here. At the very high level, you could come up with these explanations, but they wouldn't fit the specific details. So it's the details that where all the, the meat is, where all the evidence really lies. Yes, in some abstract level, you could be going to uh, the school to get too little learning, perhaps to avoid learning, <laughs> you could say, uh, or, or to avoid sending a signal or something. But again, when we have these specific detailed patterns, that's the gold that we can use to uh, make these inferences. If we say, employers pay you three times as much for graduating as they pay for other years of school, well, that's a detail that fits better with some theories than others. Okay, so uh, one other chapter that you uh, wrote was about a charity, which is perhaps uh, most relevant to, to this particular podcast. What do you think are the, are the puzzles about how people engage in charity and altruism? And, and what do you think better explains people's behavior? So as you know, being associated with the field of effective altruism, the concept of effective altruism can be this reference point for critiquing actual charity and supposed altruism. So the people do not seem to pay much attention to the effectiveness of their charity. That's one big clue. You would think if you were trying to help, you would be interested in data about how much something helped and whether it helped and who it helped. Uh, and there's really remarkably little interest in that effectiveness. People do not look it up. And uh, if you go to these charities and ask for their effectiveness data, they just don't have it. And when organizations have tried to specialize in collecting this information, uh, and sharing it, uh, these organizations have not really been willing to help much to provide this information on whether things are effective. Uh, that's d definitely one clue. Uh, another clue is the phenomena that people tend to give to more than one charity. If in, in a large world where you're just trying to be helpful, it doesn't actually make much sense to give to more than one charity, certainly not dozens. It's hard to figure out what's effective. You, you spend your limited time to find the most effective thing you can find and then give all your money to it. And unless you're ridiculously rich, you won't actually change the amount of money going to that charity very much. And that would be more effective. If you're trying to be helpful, you would make a choice between directly helping yourself or earning money to give to somebody else to pay them to help. Uh, uh, but of course, people spend a lot of time directly helping, even when they're relatively well paid and they could pay other people who are who earn much lower wages to do a lot more. This is the example of the high-flying lawyer uh, dishing out soup in a, in a soup kitchen. Exactly. So th these are some of the puzzles that suggest that uh, it's not dir just directly about helping. Uh, there are a couple more we'll probably get to in a few minutes. But the alternative theory that we suggest is that you are trying to show that you feel empathy. That is, uh, you want to show there's an emotional capacity in you such that if you see someone around you in need, you will feel like you want to do something about that. And existing charities do tend successfully to show that. They show somebody who needs help and, and in a direct way that invokes your emotions and you do help to some degree. At least you do the thing that people would say would help. And that shows people around you that you're a, not an uncaring person. And it might show them, for example, that if they were in need of help later and they were near you, you would see them and you would feel bad about them too. You want to show people that you will be a useful ally. If either of you is in trouble, the other one will come to their aid. So why is it more important to, to show to people that you're the kind of person who, you know, if they see someone in pain, they're, they're going to try to help them uh, right then and there, than, than to show that you're the kind of person who's, you know, smart enough to think about which charities are useful and, you know, does, does their research and, you know, actually tries to help people? Because, I mean, if you don't care about whether, whether charities are effective or not, might it also just be that you're not really going to pay attention to whether you're actually helping your friends or not? Right, but uh, at least, you know... If I want your help and I'm your friend, it'll be my job to put myself in your face <laughs> and to tell you about my problem. And maybe I figure I could successfully get myself in front of your face and make you pay attention to my problem and help you understand what I think is effective. And then you would just do what I say. And that's maybe what I'm mostly hoping for. And, and if you are this person who thinks carefully about how to help the best person in the world who needs help, well, I'm plausibly not going to be that best person in the world who needs help. So I'm not going to win out in that contest. So it's not actually going to be that useful to know you as the sort of person who will help the person in the world who needs the most help. In fact, it would be 
I mean, for, for most people, it would be very bad to find out that their friend was only focused on helping the worst off people because it would mean that they'll almost never want to help their friends directly, or at least not, not for that reason. That might do it for a different reason, but... Right, exactly. Uh, okay, interesting. So I guess that, that's a way in which like effective altruists or people who are focused on you know giving to people very far away who they're never going to meet, uh, signaling something that's a bit potentially disturbing to their friends, suggesting that they have other priorities that might be more important than them. Right. Now, it, it might be fine as part of your portfolio of caring. You, you might care about your friends and about your neighborhood and about people starving in Africa. That might just show you're just a person who cares all over the place. It's just if you get really focused and obsessed with only the most effective altruism that other people will raise an eyebrow and wonder if they can trust you. Hmm. So there's a couple of puzzles here because pe- people are very focused on whether charities are fraudulent or not. This has kind of been a, a real fashion lately. Uh, you know, do, do charities spend too much time on, on fundraising? Uh, that's, that's something that a lot of people worry about. And, and also, I mean, I mean, people do give a decent amount of money to, to people in, in other countries. Uh, why would they do this if they're just trying to show that they have, you know, hearts of gold and, and uh, you know, or t- tender hearts that, uh, you know, can't help but uh, help someone who's suffering in front of them? Well, as you know, uh, on the world stage, there are big things that happen that kill lots of people that we're not very concerned about. But when a few people get hurt by an intentional act, we are vastly more focused on that. So 9-11 was just 3,000 people, but it weighs a lot more heavily in people's minds because it was done on purpose. So certainly we're, we're far more wary of and watching out for you know, harm that's done on purpose. And in the case of charity, we, we want to seem caring. We also don't want to seem like we're dupes. Uh, so if the char- if the charity is spending their money, you know, and they're not stealing it for themselves, they're just spending on it, even if they're not doing it very effectively, at least we're not a dupe. Uh, they aren't taking advantage of us. They're just not being very careful. Mm. I guess also if, if you're being cynical, you might think people want to say that they're caring people and that they would give a lot of money to charity, but they but they don't want to give money to these charities because none of them are going to help or something like that. And so this allows them to have their cake and eat it too. They get to keep the money and claim to be caring anyway. Right. That's certainly an accusation about people on the street who ask for money, uh, that you, you don't want to give it to them because you're afraid that to a larger fraction of them are actually trying to dupe you, that they, they go home and take off their dirty clothes and <laughs> sit in their nice, <laughs> luxurious apartment and <laughs> laugh at how they fooled you. Okay, so what are some of the things that you think people uh, would do if they were more focused on um, you know, doing as much, as much good as possible? Well, we just mentioned a couple of them. We can add a couple more. Uh, one is that uh, not only would you try to have other people help instead of helping yourself if you can make more money than they, uh, you might try to help at a peak point in your life. That is, when you're young and 20, say, you might you know, care about people and want to help, but you really don't have much money. But more importantly, you don't, or much time even, but you don't have many social resources and, and knowledge and experience. And you just aren't as good at judging what would be effective and aren't as able to put together an organization and social group that could be effective at doing these things. So you might just think you would wait until you're maximally productive. So on jobs, we have a standard trajectory of productivity over the life cycle that people reach a peak productivity around the age 40 or 50. And those are the ages where if they start a business, they're going to be the most effective businesses that are least likely to crash and die. And people just tend to be the most effective at that peak age. So you might think that's how you would be the peak effectiveness in charity as well. Early in life, you would collect your resources and save. Uh, you would wait until you learned more and could better judge who was faking it and who was trying to dupe you and what the real problems were. And then when you finally reach some sort of peak in resources and connections and knowledge and insight, that's when you would expect to have the biggest impact and then you'd peak the charity activity then. But that's not what we see people do. In fact, it seems like people are more eager to uh, donate time and money when they are very young. (laughs) And later on, when they know a lot more, they do less. So why would it be more important to show that you're a caring person when, when you're young than when you're old? Well, we form relationships when we're young. So if you're trying to convince someone to form a relationship with you on the basis of your empathy, you have to do that before relationships are formed. Uh, as you may know, we, we form most of our relationships young in life, even work relationships, but also lovers and uh, friends. And later on in life, we don't have as many opportunities to form new relationships And that's actually something uh, older people like myself might have wished we had been more clearly told when we were younger. (laughs) You know, work harder to collect friends when you're younger. Just collect more than you need and keep them them around because it'll be much harder to collect them later. 
Okay, so so once once you're sixty or seventy, uh, even if you do manage to show off what a, what a kind hearted person you are, you just don't have that many opportunities to, to to benefit from that, or not as many as when you were at, at college. Right. Mm. Okay. And what, and what are some of the other things that you think people should do? Well, another thing we could consider doing is what I call marginal charity. That is slightly adjusting our behavior in order to make the world a better place. So one example is if you're building a building that's n stories tall, you might calculate your profit maximizing height and it might be say 12 stories. And uh, if your profit maximizing height is 12 stories, then that there's going to be a smooth peak near there. And, and if you do it 11 or 13 stories, it's actually not going to change your profit very much. Small changes in, in a maximum like there will have very low effects on your profit. But if you look at the world around and say, well, how many stories does the world need? Uh, plausibly, the optimal amount for the world isn't exactly the optimal amount for you privately. It's something different. Plausibly, it's higher, say, uh, 14 stories or something. So if you adjust your decision in the direction of the social optimum, i.e. add another story, it won't cost you very much. And on the margin, it will help the world a lot. And the ratio of the help you give to the world to how much it costs you actually goes to infinity <laughs> as you think of very small changes. Now, of course, uh, very small changes are maybe not worth the bother of thinking about, perhaps, or if there's any sort of transaction cost of making any change, uh, maybe it's not worth the bother. But just in general, you should just look at your life and ask, how can I adjust my behavior just a little bit to make the world a better place? Like, when do I leave for work? You know, am, is it a time of traffic? Is it after the peak of or before the peak of traffic? If it's before the peak of traffic, well, if I got up five minutes earlier and left five minutes earlier, it would hardly cost me much, but it might help the world a lot. Yeah. So this idea of marginal charity is is very cool. It has this kind of nice nice theoretical aspect to it that uh, at least you know ha- having studied economics, I find I find really neat. And I think maybe the reason that people don't do this is because you know building an extra story on on your hotel uh, is it's, it that doesn't really it doesn't really show what a caring person you are. People will never really know that you did that. There's no way of showing that you wouldn't have built the building that tall anyway. But I'm not actually sure that this is very useful in everyday life if you're trying to do a lot of good. Because how many opportunities do you really get to do this kind of marginal charity? And when the changes are so small, even though it's like very cost effective and that the benefit to cost ratio is high, it doesn't seem like that the total amount of benefit provided is very large relative to the amount of you know thinking that you might have to put into finding these cases and then acting on them. Do you think that that's right? Well, I think if you if you think about it, you'll find you make thousands of choices every day. And this argument in principle applies to all of them. There aren't choices that this doesn't apply to. That is, pretty much every choice you make on some parameter, uh, there'll be your personal optimum, and it won't be the social optimum, and you should just shave it in the direction of the social optimum. And so the main thing you need to do is just be able to know which direction is the social optimum for all the parameters of choice that you make. Now, it helps to be an economist to be able to figure that out, but if people are interested, I think we could teach them a couple-day course where they would be able to apply this all over the place. Like one standard example is being nice and being generous, having gratitude, be having a positive attitude. You know, all these things seem to be uh, useful for the world on average. Just be a little bit nicer to everybody you interact with. You already have some reason to be nice, reputation, and not wanting to feel like a jerk. Just be a little bit nicer, right? Smile a little bit more. Take a little more moment to uh, to look them in the eye and then be friendly. I mean. And this isn't an original thing for me. I mean, there are many people who over the centuries have said a way to help the world is just to be a little bit nicer in each of your interactions. And that's basically what I'm saying. It's just be a little bit nicer in every little thing you do. And it will cost you very little and it will help other people quite a bit. Exactly. Yeah. But in that case, how do you know that people aren't already doing that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you don't? Okay. <laughs> And if they are, great. <laughs> Which I guess is a part of the issue. It's because you don't know whether people are acting differently than, than they would otherwise, you can't really show that much about them. Right. But but just ask yourself, you know, have you bothered to think about this? <laughs> and if you aren't, then uh, you should catch up with everybody else. If everybody else is doing it, uh, well, how come you aren't? Yeah. Yeah, I do want to push back a little bit more because it's true that I make, you know, thousands of tiny decisions every day. But in most of those cases, you know, if I were to like get up a little bit earlier or I don't know, cook something, like eat slightly different food, it's just not clear that by, by shifting that a little bit, it would even be worth the like effort to think about the case. I suppose you're, you're thinking, well, you only have to think about it once and then you can just change, change your behavior forever. Yeah, just make some general policies. I mean, I guess it's also that if you think of your life as devoted to altruism, <laughs> then you think of this is going to be a small percentage of your overall effort in altruism. But for most people, they only devote a tiny percentage of their income to charity. <laughs> And so for most people, the amount that you might do through this would would rival and be comparable to what they give directly, and it would be much cheaper to them. Yeah. 
I think I think it does apply to people who are running businesses, though, or at least are making big, big decisions about, you know, uh, what kind of investments or products is a company going to make and what are they going to charge? Because in those cases, they, they actually can calculate it out and think about what the social effect would be uh, roughly and then potentially have pr- pretty, pretty large effects at very low cost to the company. And I think just going through the exercise of like thinking about all your major choices you have and what direction has social benefits, I think that would be socially useful just beyond personally doing that because that might inform us better about like how we should push politics and social policy. Well, if we all agreed that it would be better if we <laughs> weren't on the road when everybody else is there, then we might be willing to support, say, traffic congestion prices or things like that. And so one of the limit- reasons why we don't have better policy in many ways is most people just aren't really aware of which directions would make the world better. Hmm. Okay. And uh, you also suggested in that chapter that you think people should potentially leave money to be to be given out uh, a long time in the future. Do you, do you want to explain why you think that's a good idea? Right. So I first talked about waiting until you were older, which I think is the, the easier argument to make. Uh, because when you're older, you'll be fully knowledgeable and capable of making your choices. Uh, but there is a temptation to wait even longer after you're dead. Now, after you're dead, of course, you can't manage the money as directly. You will have to pay what we call the agency cost to uh, tell somebody else what to do with the money. And you have to trust them to uh, do what they you told them and on, even to understand what you said. So there is a risk and a cost there. But money accumulates over the long run uh, quite consistently at high rates of return. So I believe a standard estimate over the last century in the major developed countries, stocks and real estate both grew basically at uh, 5% per year overall, on average. 5% per year accumulates quite rapidly. (laughs) That's doubling every, say, 13 years or something, or or less. And that means a small uh, effort invested now over a long time accumulates to an enormous amount. So if your money doubles every 13 years, then in 130 years, it's gone through 10 doublings, which is a factor of 1,024. So you can honestly wait 130 years and have a thousand times as much resources to hand out. That seems to me that that could cover a fair bit of inefficiency in the fact they don't know exactly what you wanted. Uh, and of course, if a lot of you were doing this, then you could share the cost of, of managing you know, the process of, of making them do what you want. Now, famously, Benjamin Franklin actually did something like this. Uh, when he died, he was relatively wealthy and he gave the money, I believe, to the city of Philadelphia to invest for him. And uh, the rule was that after a century, they could start spending it, but they had to spread it out over the entire next century. And the way they were spending the money, I believe, was to uh, promote apprenticeships. So we thought uh, that's good for the poor people of the city, that they can have an apprenticeship and learn a useful skill, and they would make more and the city would benefit. And so that's how he spent his money. And in fact, the money did grow enormously over the century and then over the following century as well. He didn't make a 5% because the city of Philadelphia, well, it took some of the money <laughs> by not giving him as, high, as high a rate of return, but still he had plausibly a larger effect later than uh, he would have had at his time. So... Uh, there's been a pretty big active debate in the effective altruism community for a number of years about whether it actually is a good idea to, to give later or, or, to, or to give sooner. Um, and there's a whole bunch of considerations one way or the other, which probably deserves its whole, its, its whole end show. But I guess your, your claim here is just that almost no one really thinks about giving later. And the reason is that it wouldn't help them to show what nice people they are if they said, oh, sure, I'll give it, I'll give it in 50 years time. <laughs> right. Although if they created some institution to commit to it, they might seem to care more because one of the issues is the doubt that you will actually give later if you still have the choice not to give later and people want to show that they have actually made the choice to give but there's also the empathy you can't really see all these people in need a century later or two centuries later and so you can't be reacting via sort of the direct empathy of seeing them in need it must be something more cerebral and abstract which doesn't endear you as much to people who hope that you'll help them Mm. So in the effective altruism community, there's been this question for quite a long time. It's like, to what extent are people not doing the things that we think are most effective because they actually don't really care about helping other people? They, they, they care about something else, like showing that they're empathetic uh, to, to others. Uh, or, and how much is it just that they don't realize that the things that they're doing are not terribly effective? And although I think like, the arguments that you're making push in favor of the interpretation that uh, maybe people just really aren't that motivated to help others uh, sincerely, uh, that they're, they're, they're engaging in charity for other reasons. I think you also have to think that people might just be making mistakes in, in a lot of these cases. So a lot of people, for example, try to become teachers or doctors in order to try to improve the world. And our research suggests that that isn't terribly, uh, it isn't as effective, at least as, as people think. 
but it does, it, isn't it understandable that people might, might think that being a teacher or being a doctor is really helpful? You know, it just seems like, it seems like they're helping on the, on the face of it. And shouldn't that perhaps temper our cynicism, just that people could be mistaken? And sometimes when, when you explain to them that something else is going to be more effective, they, they do actually change their behavior. Not always, but sometimes. So in law, as in ordinary human norms, uh, ignorance is often an excuse. So it's okay if something happens under your watch if you didn't know about it, uh, but it's less okay if you made sure not to know. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, the president had plausible deniability if he knew that he was not hearing things because they were not telling him so that he wouldn't know, so he wouldn't be guilty. Well, that's not really so good. So a key question here is, if we are ignorant, uh, why are we ignorant? And are we comparably ignorant to other areas? And so I would say, for example, in medicine, it looks like we are go out of our way not to know things that we would know more in other analogous areas. Uh, to, to be specific, there was a study done uh, a while back of patients about to undergo surgery. And this surgery had a few percent chance of killing them. So it was a high risk surgery. This was a big deal. And these patients were asked if they would like the information about which surgeons and which hospitals in their area had what rates of death <laughs> when they performed the surgery. So that, for example, they could pick the one with a lower rate of death. Only 8% of patients were willing to pay 50 bucks to find this out. And the, when they were given the information even for free, they didn't act on it. And this is one of many examples we have that people are just not very interested in information on the quality of medicine. Uh, and relative to all the other behaviors where they ask for more information, this, is, this does stand out as different. So it's not just that we are ignorant in edu about education and about medicine. We are surprisingly ignorant. Uh, I have to say, it's really surprising that incoming college students who pick a major hardly know anything about what happens to people with that major. <laughs> <laughs> How often do they get jobs? Where do the jobs are? How many hours a week do those work? Amazingly enough, people choose majors and career plans without knowing even the basics of what will be the consequences of that, which is suspicious because they, they know an awful lot about, say, their dorm and where they're living and which, which meal plan they're having. I mean, it's not like they don't get information about anything. So in many of these areas, there's really a surprising lack of attention to information where in other areas, they pay a lot more attention to that sort of issues. Mm. And I guess, yeah, if we're trying to figure out what's the what's the appropriate level of cynicism, we could uh, look at when, when GiveWell, for example, says, oh, you know, we've looked into these, we've looked into these developing world charities and found that they're extremely effective. You know, how, how often do people actually change their giving behavior on the basis of that? How often do they care? And I guess, I mean, they've had they've had a reasonable amount of success and effective altruism is is growing. But uh, but as a percentage of the entire world activity of charity, it's still pretty small. Right. It could be growing a lot faster if people cared more. And there's, there's also the issue of how clear it is. That is, if you don't fundamentally care, but it becomes visible that you are acting in deviation from this thing you're saying, then that will look bad for you. So even if you don't directly care, you will still move in this direction as it becomes visible, not just you, but to everybody. So that suggests that it's less important to tell each person that effective altruism is more effective and more important to tell everybody that it's effective. So we have this section on advertising in our book, where we talk about how many people with products show advertising to people who will never buy the product. So Rolex watches, if you might notice, are advertised in mass context where everybody can see the ad for the Rolex watch, even though hardly anybody actually buys a Rolex watch. And plausibly, this is because the value of having a Rolex watch is the fact that when other people see you have a Rolex watch, they believe that you are a special person. And that's what you're trying to buy. <laughs> and that doesn't work unless everybody knows about the watch and what it signals. Mm. So what you're saying is that if we want to convince people to give to charities that we think are more effective, we not only have to tell them that they're more effective, but convince everyone else to judge them on the basis of whether it was effective or not. Exactly. You might think about Super Bowl ads. <laughs> so it turns out that advertising costs more the more people will see the ad per ad, per person who sees it. <laughs> so that, that's why people often want to get, say, a Super Bowl ad is because they can get the knowledge that lots of people will know that lots of other people saw it. They create more like common knowledge about the ad. And that's what you're trying to do here with effective altruism. You're trying to shame people into <laughs> doing the more effective thing because they will see other people watching them and therefore not believe that they are caring if they don't do the more effective thing. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. Are, are there any other uh, ways that you think we could, <laughs> could could improve our outreach on the basis of this like slightly more cynical explanation of people's charitable behavior? Well, that's the key one, but it has more implications. There's more detail to go into. The, the key one is that it's not enough just to convince you that this is an effective charity. You need to convince the people you're trying to impress 
that it's an effective charity so that you will want to impress them this way. So a problem with that, of course, is often that, uh, you know, you will create the impression that you feel you're holier than thou. And uh, other people may then criticize you for that. So when you try to tell everybody that this is the most effective thing, uh, are you creating the impression that the people who think they're doing this think they're better than everybody else? And then that puts a bad taste in people's mouth and they might want to actually step away from that. There have been lab experiments about what's called the uh, public goods game. Uh, in a public goods game, everybody, say, around the table, they each put money in the pot, and the amount of money in the pot is then, say, doubled or tripled, and then handed out evenly back to everybody in the room, even if you didn't put even amounts of money in the pot. So there's a temptation to not put money in the pot and take advantage of the doubling or tripling of the money that other people get. And so uh, there are many ways that people try to organize public goods games so that people will be encouraged to put more money in the pot. And one of the things they do is they let you punish other people after you see how much money they put in the pot. So you might think then, well, if, if other people don't put enough money in the pot, then we'll punish them and they'll encourage to put money in the pot and that'll make more money go in the public goods game. And that kind of works, except what happens is you punish people who don't put as much money in the pot as others. And you also punish people who put in more than others. <laughs> they actually punish people who give more than the average amount <laughs> in addition to those who give less because they're basically interpreting it as you're, 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 you're pretending you're better than the rest of us. <laughs> you're, you're putting yourself up there as being better. And I'm not, we're going to knock you down from that. Yeah, that's not okay. This is kind of like the person who works too hard uh, in, in the office and like puts everyone else to shame and you kind of resent them for it. Exactly. It's exactly like that. And so that's a problem potentially in charity and altruism which is uh, if you try to make it seem like you think you're better than everybody and that you're claiming that social mantle of, of being the superior moral person, they may resent that and try to knock you down and therefore discourage people from doing what you're telling them to do. Mm. Do you think we've seen that? I'm probably not a good person to judge because I, I would be too drawn to this kind of cynical explanation of our critics. <laughs> I, I certainly think it's part of the emotional reaction. I'm sure people would say that if they had something else they could say instead. <laughs> they might not want to admit that that's their reaction. They might want to point to something else. And people do point to a lot of kind of random things when they criticize effective altruism. So I think we are justified in asking what's the real motivation there because the things they point to kind of don't make sense. Hmm. This is good. this is good. Cynical explanations for other people's behavior rather than my own. Um, we're getting we're gonna get to your own too here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let let's talk about that. Um, so I, I imagine that you would say uh, you know even people who claim to be engaged in effective altruism just because they want to help other people may, maybe aren't quite as altruistic as as uh, they're not quite as pure as heart as as they want to let on. So my basic model of being a social scientist, my basic approach is to focus on the average typical person. <laughs> and try to explain the middle of the distribution of behavior. And knowing that people do vary, uh, but when I look at the distribution of behavior, then if I wanna look at my own behavior, I'm mostly gonna assume that I'm like everybody else unless I have a strong reason to think otherwise. Now, there is variation, and so I might not be the same as everyone, but especially in the direction I'd like to believe that I'm different, I should be suspicious of you know whatever excuses I'm coming up with to make myself think that I'm better, because maybe I'm just wanting to believe that. So effective altruists should probably follow the same strategy of, of assuming they are not that different from everybody else. And we can start to think about in what ways might they actually be different and why that might be true. That would be the next uh, correction in our calculation. But the first cut is, if you were like everybody else, uh, could we explain your behavior? <laughs> could, could that account for what we see or do we need to invoke anything else? Mm. So, so do you think you think we can explain, uh, you know, my behavior or the behavior of other people who are involved in effective altruism by by just saying, oh, well, you know, we're just as motivated by self-interest as, as everyone else? We can go a long way. It might not get everything, but it, it goes a long way. Now, I think another issue is the phenomena of the sincere nerd. So I've, I've called this the smart sincere syndrome, which is that people do vary in their social savvy and their ability to read other people socially and, and to play clever social games. And some of us are nerds, which literally means, at least in my description, that we just don't have such social skills. We can't read the social situation as accurately. We can't as subtly know when to apply one social strategy and when to apply another. And so in the situation where people are pretending to do one thing but really doing another thing, we nerds are scared that we won't know how to pull that off. We, we really won't be able to correctly like do the other thing exactly when we can get away with it or not. So we nerds are more tempted to just do the simple, sincere thing. Just go with the thing that you're supposed to be doing because we know we can do that. 
and we won't make a mistake with that. So, you know, we know people go to school for other reasons, but we're just going to go to school to learn the material because, hey, we, we know how to do that. We, we can manage that and uh, we will look okay that way. And so even with charity, I think uh, nerds tend to just adopt the simple sincerity strategy. That's, that's sort of a safe social strategy for them is just to tell themselves and other people that they're just doing the thing we say we're doing. Okay, so so the idea there would be that like nerds who are involved in effective altruism are, are trying to do as much good as possible because then they don't have to kind of play these social games of figuring out what other charity is going to make them look best. I'm not sure that that seems like such a great explanation. Well, it is the high road. So, so often again, there's a, there's a high thing we're all pretending to do. Then there's the lower things that we might actually want to do. If you aren't as good at getting away with the lower things, you might pr prefer to take the high road and then implicitly say the rest of you are, are not as good as me. <laughs> so, 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 you <laughs> right. know, so often like people who are not as good as being depraved uh, become religious and, and become the high people, high, high minded people who don't sin because they don't know how to sin and really wouldn't get away with it as well. And maybe wouldn't enjoy it or don't have as many opportunities. So, hey, why not? And this is a standard observation that, you know, later in life when you don't have as many opportunities to sin, you suddenly become religious and very pompous. Mm. So, so I guess the cynical explanation of, well, let's, let's, let's take me, for example. So, you know, I, I want to go out and say, oh, the reason I took this job is because I want, just want to help people as much as possible. I want to improve the world, you know, taking everyone's welfare impartially considered. But then you would say, well, but Rob, like, don't you kind of enjoy the stimulation uh, that you get from, you know, enjoy the, the, you enjoy the intellectual challenge? And, and maybe you're enjoying that because it allows you to, you know, show off that you're smart and that you can write well and that you can produce this podcast and people find out about you and allows you to, to say that you're actually, you know, more, more consistent and more able to figure out what's effective than other people. There's, there's all of these other kind of benefits that, that, I'm, that I get other than showing, you know, how empathetic I am to, to people directly in front of me. Is that, is that, that, that's kind of the story that you tell? Well, it's a story. Story you could tell. But I mean, the fundamental story here is just human behavior is com complicated. People vary enormously from person to person and context to context. And in almost all these areas, the usual story does describe some people some of the time. So no doubt some people some of the time are, in fact, focused on helping. It's less than we like to think, but it's certainly true. The, the question is just how to infer in which particular cases it's how true. And so one of the variations in people is that some people actually care more. And so the question is, what fraction of the variance of some people being effective altruists uh, is explained by that factor? And there are some other factors that, that are available to explain, and I'm not going to say I know. <laughs> okay. I was trying to draw you out because you do know a fair few of us. So maybe you could tell whether we're, if, if we're hypocrites, but I guess, I guess you don't want to don't name names. <laughs> Well, we may get to talking about the, the effective altruism community and some of its other features, and that data could be more relevant data for illuminating this. Merely knowing that some people are effective altruists by itself doesn't say that much. Again, it always comes down to the detailed patterns. Those are the key cues that I use. Hmm. So, so are there any you know, patterns in effective altruism that you think indicate that we're maybe deviating from you know, being as altruistic as we could be? And I mean, I mean maybe we could learn there you know, other ways that we could have more impact if, if, if we realize that we're actually doing things for, like, for, for selfish reasons. Well, one thing I've said and even given a talk at an effective altruism event years ago is that effective altruism is a youth movement. It has many features that are classically the sort of features that a youth movement has. And that's distinctive and, and data to uh, interpret people's behavior. So, uh, you know, you think of, say, the 60s uh, counterculture, think of uh, libertarian movements after that, think of uh, blockchain communities today. These are all youth movements, and they have the distinctive feature that they are mainly composed of young people. And these young people have something new that they think it wasn't there before. Uh, they are focused on talking to themselves more than to other older people. They, they think that uh, younger people are more appropriate for roles in their organizations and their groups. Uh, they have complaints that the older generation has uh, you know, not been keeping up and, and, and missing out on something, and they're going to replace that. And uh, youth movements for, through the centuries have uh, you know, somewhat of a random gamble, but often they have uh, benefited the youth in large ways. And that's plausibly what's going on here. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I'll, put, I'll stick up a link to this blog post where you uh, described effective altruism as a youth movement. Is, is there anything wrong with being a youth movement? I mean, I, I read it and I kind of agreed. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of young people. Yeah, to some extent, they, they criticize uh, the older generation and, and the mistakes that they perceive them as, as having made. But is, is there is there anything concerning about that? Well, often the youth movements, perhaps unfairly, exclude older people. <laughs> from their new movement. So if the world doesn't change, then when you're young, you have to slowly work for decades to rise up to the position that the old people existing now have, uh, if you rise through their existing hierarchies. If you can find a way to set aside the existing hierarchies and create a whole new thing, 
then the youth can have a big advantage.、Mm, then you can start at the top. Right, exactly. And so that's an advantage of a youth movement is, is to somehow like set things aside. So you can see that perhaps in the crypto coin world,、uh, instead of just rising in the finance industry through the slow rise of the existing world, then you might start a whole new finance industry and you could start in on the ground floor and suddenly you're as good as anybody else. And then as you do that, you might, even if there were you succeeding and even if there were older people who wanted to come in and join you, you might like not let them. <laughs> Because hey, this was this is us,、uh, you know, pushing you guys aside. Don't don't try to grab onto us now. Because <laughs> <laughs> then they'll take the senior roles because they they're more experienced. Yeah, we we you know, we, we came out in the ocean and we shot your your boat down, and now you're trying to swim over to our boat and get on our boat. Well, you know, and so, you know, so so to the extent that that's the kind of thing that goes on here, the it's it's suspicious when you、uh, go out of your way to exclude、uh, the older people from from、uh, participating. You know that's just a common feature of youth movements, and it's not just like direct exclusion, but also just、uh, a suspicious obsession with internal conversation. Like you, you create a whole new terminology for everything. You presume that all existing discussion is pretty irrelevant to your new different thing, and you re- basically reinvent a lot of things, creating new terms and new structures. You know, plausibly for the purpose of just keeping out the people who are going to do things the old ways from jumping in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I that I think effective altruism is doing that. All that much, I guess it's it's true.、Uh, we have criticisms of、uh, you know the ways things have been done in the past, but I think there's also a lot of respect, at least among at least among many people, for the fact that we've kind of grown out of you know existing movements that were kind of already happening, and we're just kind of the the next step on a on a, on a long chain of you know trying trying to quantify the effects that different things have, trying to be more more reasonable.、Uh, you know, ev- evidence based policy, that that kind of thing. Just make a distinction between what what might be the individual selfish policies that are here. Also, of course, youth movements have social benefits. I mean, the world does often get stuck in old ways, <laughs> and often what it does take to make a big change is to have a whole group of people together、uh, coordinate to try to change it all together. That's that's a perfectly reasonable way to help the world in general in terms of the existence of the youth movement. I mean, what I've also said is that if you if you were honest about it, you would expect that early on in the youth movement. Its direct actions on the world would be largely ineffective and not very useful. The major benefit of youth movement is that as they grow up in life and reach peak productivity decades later, at that point they will have these strong social bonds. They will be in positions of influence, and then they will have their maximum influence. But that's not what people want to say. So people like to pretend that the youth movement, just when it's get going, is having a big influence, but that's really not when it has a big influence.、Uh, so the, you know the '60s protests. Uh, or counterculture didn't actually have that much of an effect back then,、uh, but later on, when those same people rose into positions of influence and and, and bonded with each other and, and pushed for policies, they had much more influence later.、Mm. I guess that, that's a somewhat hopeful message that、uh, even if we're not accomplishing much now in the in the future, <laughs> as we as we become well, it, it is right,、uh, but but it means you, if you're going to be honest about it, you should accept that you're not actually going to be doing that much useful in the short term. You'll be creating these strong bonds and the strong identity that you can draw on later. Okay, well let let's go back to thinking about the value of of, of the hidden motivations view of of human behavior. What else can people learn from this to potentially you know?、Uh, Be more effective in in their own life. Should they kind of make peace with the fact that they have hidden mot- motivations and accept them, and then find ways to make them work in favor of of their of their higher goals? Okay, first we should admit that evolution designed you to be ignorant to these things. So if I'm telling you about something, I am countering evolution's plan for you. And if evolution had your interest at heart and expected roughly the kind of situation you're actually in, I'm doing you a disservice <laughs> because I'm messing up the plan. So hopefully, of course, you, if you realize that, you could just forget about this and go ahead with your life because people do actually manage to forget pretty much every podcast they hear, etc. So <laughs> it's really not that hard, right? Okay, but、uh, evolution may not have anticipated every situation that everybody might be in today. You might be unusually in need of a, a frank understanding of the world around you. You might be a manager or a salesperson, for example.、Uh, those people need to have a more direct understanding. You also might be a nerd. <laughs> I.e., someone for whom their intuition just doesn't smoothly help them manage the social world around them, and for them, conscious analysis of the social world can be more useful than it is for other people. And you might be someone who has aspirations or practice of being a policy analyst. You might be someone who says, "We understand medicine or education well enough to think about how we should change it." And if that's the sort of person you're claiming to be, then I think it's more your obligation to understand what's really going on, even if it's a little bit of a personal awkward. Consequence. Th- think of the analogy of a mortician. Most of us would feel uncomfortable touching dead people. 
I think that's safe to say. And if you came across a friend who seemed to be very comfortable touching dead people, you might be a little grossed out by that. But a mortician whose job it is to touch dead people, well, that can be okay. Uh, it's okay if they get used to something creepy that the rest of us aren't used to. And as long as they like keep it within their community, you, you kind of expect within the mortician community, that's what they expect is they're comfortable touching dead people. Uh, and so similarly for policy analysts, uh, we should expect policy analysts to be more frank and honest about the world in ways that we individually might not be, because it's their job to figure out what's going on and tell us what to do. Mm. So, so the concern might be that if, if you didn't understand what was actually motivating people and then you tried to change policy in one way, uh, one direction or another, it's not going to work out how you think, because in fact, you know, people are, are, are behaving according to quite a different set of rules than, than the ones that you think they are. Right. So I would say that most policy analysts try to find reforms that will give people more of what they pretend to want. And that goes badly when people know that it isn't what they really want. So to be successful, more actually successful and get people to actually embrace policy reforms, what we need to do is find changes in policy such that they allow people to continue to pretend to be trying to get the thing they want to pretend to want while actually getting more of the things they actually want, even if they can deny it. Do you have any good concrete examples of that, where, where policy might go wrong if you didn't take this into account? Well, certainly just with things like education or medicine, uh, we subsidize them on the belief that the thing that we say we're trying to get is a good thing and therefore we should get more of it. Once you realize that's not really happening, you, the case for subsidizing goes way down. In fact, the case for taxing might even go up. Yeah, maybe we should be taxing school and medicine instead of what we're doing now. So that's one very simple variation. Um, I mean, we could, we, could, we could try to think about more complicated ones, but our book is not primarily trying to c uh, come up with solutions. We're mainly trying to make the case that, in fact, we are mistaken about a lot of different motives and that this has big implications. So moving away from policy more, more to people's kind of in individual lives, I think one of the ways that I think this perspective can can be helpful of, of like making making peace with the motivations that you have that, that maybe aren't the most high minded is that if you just think about it quite consciously, then you can try to find ways that you can accomplish both your like selfish goal and perhaps your like more high minded goal at the same time. So, so let's say that, you know, actually I just really enjoy the attention of, of uh, running a podcast or something like that. Then I can think, well, no, what things could I do that would allow me to, you know, achieve some level of fame that would also be, be, be really useful. That would also be really, be really effective for the world. And if you're just very explicit about it, then you can potentially find ways of kind of lining up the selfish motivation and, and the altruistic motivation. Do you think, do you think that's a big potential benefit? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, another way I would think about it is you can't change the fact that you care what other people think, but you might be able to change which other people you're focused on impressing. So the, the old, you know, what would Jesus do is an example of focusing your attention on a particular sort of audience and asking what would they think about it? Or you might ask, what would Einstein think of what you were doing? That is, instead of trying to impress like the average person who might like your tweet, Think about somebody higher in your mind that you would be focused on trying to impress. And then you will still be caring what they think and trying to impress them, but maybe that will push you in a better direction. Mm. And I guess that, yeah, this is this is a benefit of potentially having uh, a community of people who are focused on doing good effectively is it allows us to get the enjoyment of showing off to other people when, when we actually do do things that are useful because they're going to judge us by that standard. Absolutely. So medicine would probably be vastly more effective if more people knew about the effectiveness of individual medical treatments. When, when grandma's sick and the doctor says, let's do the surgery, and you say, yes, of course, because I care about grandma, that would le seem a lot less caring if everybody knew the particular surgery that was being suggested was actually going to hurt her and just make her more pain and, and you know not actually do much. It doesn't look very caring if you're pushing something that doesn't actually help much and just going to cost money. So it's because the audience doesn't really know which medical treatments are effective that you can you know, push for some medical treatment that doesn't help and be credited for caring. The same for charity, of course, and altruism. The more that everybody knew about the relative effectiveness of charity, the more that people would be pushed to give to good charities just because they don't want to be shamed <laughs> looking like uncaring. It wouldn't actually look like you cared very much if you gave to a bad charity. Mm. So... I think a lot of people listening might feel like this perspective on human nature is a, is a little bit grim, that, that imagining or thinking about the, the fact that you know, everyone around us is a bit more self-serving than, than they let on uh, is, is a bit depressing. But it, but it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like, like you find it that way. Um, well, why, why, doesn't, why doesn't this bother you at all? If you stand all the way back and you compare humans to all the other creatures we know about, humans are spectacular. <laughs> humans uh, not only 
are smart and capable, we cooperate really well. We cooperate in enormous, complicated ways, and we rely on each other and we trust each other. So just from the point of comparing us to other animals and, and just looking at what we can achieve together, we are remarkable creatures who also seem to be remarkably moral. That is, we are remarkably helpful to each other and uh, considerate of each other in ways that other animals are. And we look great as long as you're comparing us to other animals. The way we look bad is when you compare us to the angels we pretend to be. But as soon as you realize that those angels were just not very realistic possibility, <laughs> that, that, that was just never going to happen, then you can be much more okay with liking the creatures that we are. Mm. Yeah, I guess the whole way through I've been describing these explanations as, as cynical explanations. But so if you think about it just as, you know, people want to be want to be loved by other people uh, or, they, or they, they want other people to hold them in high esteem. In, in, a, in a sense, that's not like such a bad motivation, right? That's a, that's a very pro-social motivation that you care what others think. Especially when it's others that the rest of us respect. Hmm. Yeah. So was there anything else you wanted to, to add about the book? Perhaps you want to give a, give a pitch for people to, to actually buy it and perhaps they find it more persuasive if they go through the details? I, I want to mention that this book is greatly improved by my co-author, Kevin Simler. Uh, he paid a lot more attention than I usually would to uh, making it very readable with lots of examples, personal stories. Uh, that means it's actually you can just pick it up and be carried along through it. That wasn't true so much of my first book, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life, When Robots Rule the Earth. And that's credited to my uh, co-author. And so it is a book that you can just read and easily learn a lot. But it is also a book that makes a big claim that I think uh, can change how we think about the world if enough people take it seriously. All right. Well, let's let's move on to talking about kind of opportunities for systemic change in society, which has been a, an ongoing interest of yours. What, what are some cases uh, that you can see for how we could reorganize kind of how society makes decisions that you think could, could have a really large impact? So again, I started out my social science career focused on alternative institutions, way we could redesign things. And first, of course, I read mainly about other people's proposals to reorganize uh, institutions. And then I started to develop some of my own. And uh, it seems like we can find large improvements all across the social world, large improvements that continue to be ignored and not adopted. So a basic question is, why aren't we adopting all these improvements? And the perspective suggested by our book, The Elephant in the Brain, is that we aren't being very honest about our main motives. So education researchers for many decades have come up with reforms that would help us to learn more material faster. And they consistently show that they work. And we have consistently not applied them to schools, plausibly because we're just not very focused on making schools learn more because it's not the point. There are a lot of interesting ways we could improve medicine. Uh, one of them, for example, is to merge health and life insurance. Uh, if you combine a package of health and life insurance, then your health insurance sure now has a risk of losing if you die, and they therefore want to focus more on your health. Then you don't need to be as regulatory about insisting that they do the right thing. You can more trust them to have good incentives. So, so this would be the idea that you, your doctor gets uh, rewarded if you stay alive or something like that. Right, and, and punished if you die. And you could extend that to pain and disability, and it would be a straightforward way to make medicine much more effective, but there's just very little interest in it. Okay, so, so that was medicine. Did, did you have any other, any other big ideas that came out of the, the book? Well, uh, we don't even have a chapter on law, but I, uh, I've been teaching law and economics for many years, and I think there are some big potential improvements with criminal law. Uh, and you know, just quickly, I, I think it would make sense to... Uh, require everybody to get crime insurance so that they could uh, pay off if they were found guilty of a crime. And then we could make most penalties into fines for when you did commit a crime. And then we could uh, make private bounty hunters <laughs> rewarded for prosecuting crimes. And we would take out the uh, public police, which are so problematic and, and being corruptible and immune to uh, prosecution. But that, but that's a, that's a, we don't have time to go into that. But in politics, people have come up with many alternative political institutions that would seem to be better. And people have very little interest in political institutions. They have enormous interest in politics, i.e. left versus right and who's winning. But if you talk to talk to them about voting rules or rules of you know how bills passed and all that sort of thing, they just get really bored, <laughs> which is a shame because I think we can actually at the meta level, choose better institutions for helping us to choose better institutions in medicine and school and law, et cetera. We, we could set up a political process that would most fundamentally choose better institutions when they're actually effective. So, uh, yeah, what, what are some of those institutions that you think might be more effective? Well, again, I, I was mentioning specific you know things in medicine or law or a school, but in general, I think there's a way to reorganize how we choose policy uh, that would be more effective. And that goes under the name futarchy, as I've given it, or also 
decision markets, uh, which is a variation on prediction markets. And I think that has enormous potential to reform governance. Mm. Okay, yeah, Futak is uh, a pretty big idea, a little bit complicated, but, but I think let, let's dive into it because it's, it's, I think, one of the most interesting ideas that you've had. Um, what, what is Futak, Ian, and why would it do a better job? So let's start with prediction markets. Uh, a prediction market is just another name for a speculative market or a betting market. So, of course, uh, you could have a bet on, for example, whether a sporting team will win a contest. Uh, if you have a project with a deadline, you could have a bet on whether you'll make the deadline. And it turns out uh, these speculative markets uh, do a remarkably good job of collecting information together into a market price that represents an estimate or a probability of something. And this is something we've consistently seen over a long time, uh, that if you have a topic that you would like an estimate on that eventually we'll know the answer to that we don't know now, setting up a betting market on it is a very effective way to create information on that. And you can just believe the current market price as your best estimate if you're not a specialist in the topic. So that's the idea of prediction markets. And decision markets are a variation on prediction markets where the market makes a prediction about the consequence of a decision. And that can allow you to have markets directly advise you about decisions. So my favorite example is a fire the CEO markets. So at the moment we have stock markets and in a stock market you could trade cash for stock. So if it costs $21 for one stock, then the price of the stock is 21. We could make trades in stocks conditional. So we could say, well, I'm trading $21 for one stock, but this trade will be called off if a condition isn't met. And then we could have a market for those kind of trades and that market will give us a conditional price. So ordinarily, when you're estimating how much is a company worth, you're trying to average over all the different scenarios that might happen to the company. You're saying, in each of those scenarios, how much is the company worth? And then you do a weighted average to decide overall how much the company's worth. In a conditional market, you're averaging over many scenarios, but only scenarios consistent with the condition, which could give you a different number. So if we have a market in the stock price in a company conditional on the CEO staying till the end of the quarter in that quarter, then when you're estimating the value of the stock there, how much money you're willing to pay, you're averaging over all the scenarios consistent with the CEO staying till the end of the quarter. Now, if we have another market, which the stock trades are called off if the CEO doesn't leave by the end of the quarter, <laughs> then in that market, you'll be focused on all those scenarios consistent with the CEO leaving. And these two markets should give different prices because they're averaging over different sets of scenarios. If the price of the company, if the CEO leaves, is higher than the price of the company if the CEO stays, you can interpret that as the stock speculators telling you, dump the CEO. <laughs> this company is worth more without them. And a board of directors could take that as advice and follow it. And that would be an example of a decision market because there's a decision, keep the CEO or not, and there's an outcome, the stock price of the company, and we're setting a decision conditional estimate, i.e. what's the estimate of the stock price conditional on keeping the CEO or not. And using those two numbers, we can use the market to give advice about the decision. And this is a mechanism we could apply much more broadly. Okay. W wouldn't you have this problem that uh, the CEO is more likely to get fired if there's been some like negative shock to the company, you know, in, in, even if the CEO wasn't responsible? So, so typically you would expect that the, that the value of the company if the CEO is fired is going to be lower, not necessarily because the CEO is messing up, but just like any bad luck will both cause the price to be lower and the CEO to be more likely to get fired? That could be a problem early in the quarter. Uh, as we get to the end of the quarter, uh, it won't be as much of an issue. That is, uh, if we're about to make the decision to fire the CEO, then we don't have to worry very much about information coming out between now and the decision time being made. It, when there's a lot of time in between, then you, yes, you have to worry about what scenarios could reveal information and how that might be correlated with the price. And so that's why I would recommend you mainly make this decision at one moment when the price is about set for that moment and, and not be do it far ahead. So it seems like shareholders would, would really like having this information. Uh, it was kind of a no-brainer for them to set this up and then they'll be able to figure out, it would give them a good idea of whether to fire the CEO or not. So, so why, don't, why don't we already use markets like this? Well, that's... Related to the question of why don't we use prediction markets for more other things in organizations. And this was one of the first puzzles that I came across that helped me to look for hidden motives. <laughs> that is, organizations talk as if better information for the organization would something they want, something that they are eager for. It's the story that people like to tell about their activities. But it's not actually a strong emotion, as they say. <laughs> that is, in most organizations, there's a lot of politics going on. And these markets can get in the way of that politics and hinder somebody's strategies. So a more concrete example of that is a market for a project deadline. 
So as you may know, most projects, uh, they have periodic meetings where they say, are we on track to make the deadline? What's the chance we'll make the deadline? And usually they say, yeah, we're going to make the deadline. It looks pretty good. And then a lot of the time they don't. <laughs> okay. Now you might think that a market in whether you make the deadline would give you earlier warning about whether you're going to have problems. And that would give you earlier chances to either change the project or abandon it, which would save you money. And that's true. And so therefore you should want these markets if you were, you know, running the whole company and, and just caring about whether the project works. But you should think, what if I were running the project? If you were running the project, you would think ahead and say, this project might fail. How will I cover my butt in that case? What will my excuse be? And everybody's favorite excuse on a project that might fail is, the thing that killed my project came out of left field at the last minute, no one could have seen it coming and it'll never happen again, so there's nothing to do. That's their favorite excuse if you can make it stick. Now, uh, you can make that stick if you make sure that all of the meetings up until the last minute keep saying, yes, of course, we're going to make the deadline. It's more of a problem if there's this outside estimate that keeps saying you're not going to make the deadline, you're not going to be able to make the deadline well in advance. That kind of kills your story and makes it a lot harder to make excuses about why you didn't make the deadline. So if you'd rather protect your excuse, if you don't make the deadline, then you know, raise the probability that you will make the deadline. You might not want to have a prediction market about the deadline. Hmm. Wouldn't it be helpful to have kind of the, the early warning because then you can adjust the deadline and then you kind of you don't you don't have to miss it. So yes, that would be helpful, but it also can get in the way of your excuse, and management would rather protect their excuse than help avoid the problems. Hmm. I suppose it it also shows uh, early on maybe that you, that you're not doing such a good job, so they might just get rid of you at that point. Right now, I still think there's enormous long term potential here. I just think it has to overcome short term obstacles. I like to make the analogy with cost accounting. Today, almost all organizations do cost accounting on almost all projects just as a matter of course. It's just the way we do things. But imagine a world where nobody did cost accounting and you proposed to do cost accounting on a project. That could be interpreted by the people around you as saying, um, somebody's stealing around here. We should find out who. What, what, what is cost accounting, sorry? Uh, it's just when you keep track of the costs of projects, where we keep track of where the money went and how it was spent and where it came, you know. Right, right, okay. And so almost today, almost anything we do, we, we track cost accounting. We track uh, where the money went. And so uh, when people steal, that's way, that shows up in the cost accounting. That's one of the main reasons we do cost accounting is to watch out for people stealing. And so any world where nobody did cost accounting, you're proposing to do it would be interpreted as... An accusation. Accusation that somebody's stealing. And I suppose if people actually were stealing, they, they really wouldn't like it because it is going to interfere with their stealing. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> now, in a world where everybody does cost accounting and you say, let's not do cost accounting on this project, <laughs> that will be interpreted as saying, could we just steal and not talk about it? <laughs> Which would also not go over very well. So the analogy with prediction markets is uh, in a world where nobody does prediction markets, it might be hard to introduce one. You would basically be saying, there's a lot of bullshit around here. Could we just cut through that and find out what people really think? Which might not go over well on the people who are bullshitting, right? In a world where everybody had prediction markets, say on every project that has a deadline, and you said, could we just skip the prediction market this time? That could be interpreted as you're saying, uh, we're not going to make the deadline. Could we not talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which would also not go over well. So you can see there's multiple equilibria. So I have hope eventually that prediction markets could become the standard practice, just like cost accounting is, even though any one proposal in the absence of others would be seen as some sort of accusation. Okay, so across a bunch of these ideas, you know, with medicine, with education, with with having these prediction markets, there's big potential gains, as you said, as you said, because we're not using you know the best known possible methods, but at the same time, there's huge obstacles to to putting them into place uh, because they they potentially aren't in the interest of the people who are currently part of the system. So, how do you? I mean, do you spend a lot of time thinking about how you can make it in the interest of everyone who's involved to to implement these changes? And like, are there many success stories of that kind? I have ideas, but I think the main thing we need is just a lots of concrete trials. So uh, there's a large literature among academics of these ideas that have been piling up for years in the journals. And academics are willing to write theorems. They're willing to do lab experiments, sometimes even field experiments to collect a certain amount of data. But they're really not willing to get involved in the messy details of an organization and just try out different variations until they see something that actually works. Because then you're not dealing in the abstract concepts that academics like to deal with, you're dealing with actual detailed organizations. That's what we need mostly to make this sort of thing happen. So there's a huge effective altruist opportunity here that by designing and fielding better institutions, we can just get enormous gains in medicine and law and school and politics and all over the place. We could just, just be a lot more effective 
with no you know, particular downside cost, but it requires this investment in people going out and working out the details. And people have already made investments in working out the abstract academic concepts. What you need to do is work out the concrete social details, which is the sort of thing academics don't get paid for. Right. Is it that they don't get paid for or that it doesn't help them to show off how smart they are? <laughs> That's one explanation I've heard. Well, because they, they get paid to show off how smart they are. <laughs> okay, right, right. So basically, when you submit a paper to a journal, the overwhelming criteria the journal will use is how impressive is this? And to be impressive, you need to use standard tools in a difficult way. You need to show that you can master difficult data sets, statistical techniques, game theory models, etc., and you can do it better than others. And you need to therefore be using one of our standard methods in a way that's comparable to other people. And we just don't have a standard way to show off how smart you are by getting involved in the messy details of an organization and finding a way to make something work. Mm. Okay, so you're saying the thing that's most neglected in this sort of social science is not so much figuring it out, it out in the big picture, but actually getting your hands dirty and trying to implement it in a specific organization or a specific case and then seeing what the barriers are and just trying to overcome them? Exactly. <laughs> Trial and error, hands-on, because you know, that doesn't have the grand theory prestige associated with it. Okay. So, so let's say that someone was listening to this and they said, oh, you know, I'm going to try to make it be the case that people waste less money on, on medicine that doesn't work because well, that's just not useful and they're doing it for this other reason that they want to show that they care and we can find other cheaper ways for people to show that they care about one another. But mightn't they just run into the fact that people kind of don't want this change? There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be harmed. Uh, a lot of people, uh, people aren't going to realize that the reason you, you want to reduce the spending on medicine isn't that you're an evil person. It's that you don't think it actually improves their health. Um, like, how do we even know that there's that there's really a practical opportunity to change things there? So, as I said, the way policy analysts usually think about policy is they try to figure out ways to get people more of the things they say they want. And the real problem is how to let people continue to pretend to get what they want while actually getting more of what they really want. So that's a more complicated design problem, and it's not something that shows up in the journals as well. And so you'll have to pay attention to that more complicated problem when you're trying to figure out things that actually work in real context. We, we could do more abstract academic work on that, but we also need more practical experimentation. So if you're going to find a way to produce more effective medicine, you'll need a way to let people continue to show that they care. You'll need to continue to pay attention to how empathetic it looks to do something and if you could find a way that you, someone could seem to care even more while also being more effective, then that's a win. So plausibly, for example, a hospice is an example of that, which is an innovation that wasn't always there. In a hospice, you say, well, we're not actually helping very much medical and wide, and we don't have much prospect of helping. Why don't we stop focused on you know, curing this person and just make them more comfortable as they die? And that's caring. <laughs> That is, if you believe that, in fact, there's not much more to do and the things you might try to do will just make them in more pain and, and discomfort, you might think, well, let's focus on comfort now. And that can not both save money and uh, be more caring. Are there any people who you admire for, for having been particularly good at solving these kinds of problems? I, I wish I knew. <laughs> maybe maybe I, if I find more research, I'll find more examples. But so far, I'm happy enough just to point out this uh, problem, the way that uh, we have been misunderstanding the policy issues we've been facing. And again, uh, hopefully we're just opening up a big new area and lots of other people can come in and do lots more work. We, we certainly haven't said the last word here at all. We've just said there's this basic problem. We've given 10 examples. And again, there could probably be 10 or 20 or 30 more other areas of life that could be given the same treatment. And in each of these areas, we can think about how to produce reforms that would still let people pretend what they're pretending, what actually giving them more what they want. So before you wrote Elephant in the Brain with your co-author, you wrote this other book, uh, The Age of M, which is quite a, quite a unique book, unlike almost anything else I've, I've ever seen published. Maybe, maybe it is actually just completely unique in, in trying to use complicated social science to map out a very kind of detailed possible future that the world could take. I think we don't have time to go into kind of all of the um, ideas that you had in there. But uh, what is your approach to futurology? And, and do you wish kind of more people would try to, to make these concrete predictions about how the future could go? Yeah, I was trying to create an example to inspire other people to copy me. And we'll see if that succeeds or not. The, the word futurology, just the phrasing of it, just, just grates on me. But I don't have an <laughs> argument against it. Futurism is a little better, although it's not that much better. So, you know, we have a lot more people studying history than the future. And uh, as you may know, we can't do anything about the past, but we have at least a chance of doing something about the future. So you might think we would study the future more than the past in terms of the value that we could get out of it, but in fact, we don't. If you ask people, well, why don't we study the future more? 
the usual straightforward answer will be, well, on the past, we've got data, we've got documents and artifacts, and we can study these documents and artifacts uh, to draw inferences about the past, and we have no such data about the future, so we can't study the future. And of course, that's true as far as it goes, uh, but we don't just study the past with data, we also mix in theory. The data by itself actually wouldn't tell us very much. Uh, but with theory, we can infer a lot more, and we can infer the future if we just apply theory, and I think we can go a lot farther than we have. Now, when I was a physics undergraduate, my physics professors basically said that those people in that other building over there called social science, they were just making it up. They didn't know anything. <laughs> And I think a lot of people who do tech futurism have that same attitude. They have a tech education in physics or engineering or computer science, and they were basically told that there is no such thing as social science. It doesn't exist. So when they start to think about future technologies, as they often do, uh, when they get to thinking about the social implications of those technologies, they often decide that their own speculations or thoughts on the top of their head are about the best anybody could do because there is no social science. And so you do see tech futurists uh, who have specialized in forecasting technology, they don't go call up a social scientist and ask them to analyze their scenario. They just take what's at the top of their head and they write it down as if it was the best thing anybody could do. And that's all they even think of doing. And I think that's just really mistaken. <laughs> there is social science. Uh, I've learned a lot of social science. I'm now a professor of economics. And so I think it is possible to take a specific concrete technology scenario and work out a lot of social implications. Now, it doesn't mean we can figure out everything, but we can figure out many things, as you may know. We have physics enough to help us predict the weather. That doesn't mean we can predict everything about the weather. It means we can predict many things about the weather. And other things, we have a good theory that says we shouldn't be able to predict it. And social science is like that too. We can predict many things, and there are other things we don't think we can predict. So my basic story is we have been neglecting analyzing the future. The right way to analyze the future, at least a good way, is to break it down into technology scenarios of which technologies appear what, when, and what form. And then for each technology scenario, try to predict the social implications by just applying the standard social science tools to make predictions. And that we should just do this for a lot of different technology scenarios. We shouldn't get too argumentative about which scenarios are how likely. I mean, I would actually prefer to have a prediction market about that if we could do it, but we should just consider a lot of scenarios. And for each one, ask what would be the social implications. And so our my book, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life When Robots Rule the Earth is intended to be an example of this by taking one common scenario of a technology that appeared often in science fiction and futurism of brain emulations and just trying to work out as many implications of that as I can. And my book just doesn't try very hard to argue for that scenario being a plausible one. I just think people have done enough of that elsewhere. I mainly focus on what would happen if. And so I see myself as being pretty conservative. I'm not speculating wildly. <laughs> in the sense that I'm just applying our standard social science tools and many other tools to that scenario. Now, this is a book you couldn't really have written unless you knew a lot of different fields. And I think uh, that people who know a lot of different fields should be the kind of people to write this book. That is, I'm describing an entire civilization, so I have to use physics and computer science, and political science, economics, business, some psychology. I have to think about mating. I have to think about friendship. I have to think about cities. And so you just need to know a lot about how many different areas of the world work in order to put together a whole picture of how the world would change. But I think that's straightforwardly possible. You just need to read a lot of different areas and learn our standard theories. So I'm mostly applying our most straightforward standard theories in each area. I'm not going into really complicated models. I'm just going for the simplest things we know about each area and just saying, what does this theory apply? That is, what do the theories we have here say about the particular scenario that at hand? Hmm. So I think most people who uh, think that they know anything about futurism uh, would think that they know that people in the past who tried to predict the future have a dismal record. And in fact, you know, it was, it was absolutely no better than chance. Does history show that we, that we can predict the future with like any reasonable degree of accuracy? So I have some personal history here. Um, back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, I was in Silicon Valley associated with the group called Xanadu, who was trying to create the World Wide Web. They didn't call it that. And they succeeded in part in the sense that they had some design principles and the person, Tim Berners-Lee, who actually created what became the World Wide Web, listened to them and included some of their insights. They failed in part because they tried to implement too many features and, and couldn't get it done in time. But I had the experience of seeing people who were trying to predict the future and create the future and having a lot of people around them poo-poo them and think that was pretty wild speculation. <laughs> then having it actually happen and quickly grow 
And then hearing people say, no one could have seen this coming when I knew that people did see it coming. And also seeing that the people who saw it coming didn't actually get much personal reward, which is plausibly why we don't actually try that hard to predict the future. So that showed me certainly that it's possible to predict a big radical technology change before it happens to foresee the rough outlines of it and get some of the key social issues right. And that people would initially, before it happened, poo-poo it and think that's pretty speculative and wild. And after it happened, say no one could have seen it coming <laughs> and see that the people involved didn't get much personal reward. Hmm. So what kinds of things did the people in the Xenadu project uh, accurately predict? Well, they actually predicted the issue of quality control and uh, the key importance of links, the need for some sort of standard URL naming convention that would specify, uh, you know, in a global way, different files. There was the issue of uh, versioning and to what extent could you uh, go back to a previous version of a website as opposed to seeing what the current version is. Uh, a lot of these key issues uh, they got basically right. Hmm. Did they foresee, you know, things like Amazon or social media or is that was that too far out? That's too far out. <laughs> uh, you know, mainly they were focused on documents and what you could have in documents. And they were somewhat misled in terms of, uh, they were really focused on what they called backlinks, which would allow you from a document to find the documents that link to it, which would then help you find criticism of a document. And they thought that would be important. We don't actually have backlinks directly with the web, but uh, Google can help you get something pretty close. Which And the backlinks didn't actually help so much to, to promote criticism in the way they had hoped. Hmm. So one thing that really frustrates me is uh, when people point to, you know, really bad predictions that, you know, someone made 50 or, or 100 years ago. And the reason it annoys me is typically that they're, they're, they're pulling out kind of the most extreme predictions that someone made, often someone who was just trying to get attention, someone who was basically doing it just for the sake of entertainment. Um, then they use this to say, well, you know, even someone who was serious uh, couldn't couldn't do a good job of predicting the future. Have you ever seen someone do a kind of more neutral survey where they try to look at, you know, a, a lot of different predictions that were made, not, not just by entertainers, but by serious people who kind of cared whether they were right or wrong uh, to see, you know, how often, you know, what was their strike rate? I cite such a study in the book. I believe it went over a thousand different predictions of technologies uh, and of when those technologies would appear and then when they did appear. And the predictions were certainly better than random in terms of timing. Uh, many predictions were of technologies to appear that had already appeared, but the people predicting didn't know that. <laughs> right. You know, five or 10% of the predictions were about things that were already true. Uh, but even, you know, ignoring that, uh, yes, it, it is in fact possible to predict uh, when future technologies will appear because we have this whole data set of predictions and when they actually appeared. Now, you know, the error rate is still pretty high, uh, but it is possible. Now, you know, I'm somewhat of a futurist and I'm in the habit of looking at other futurist books. And I notice that a lot of people who make futurist predictions today aren't really trying very hard. The, the ones who get the most press are often the ones who are not trying very hard at all. And then they're just, you know, trying to sell books and trying to be engaging, et cetera, which is fine for that audience. But, you know, it seems pretty clear. Even today, we've got people making spectacularly wrong predictions that we could already tell right now or not going to be right <laughs> if we're somebody who studies the future. But, you know, if you're out there just trying to make inspiring talks and dramatic stories, et cetera, you don't need to pay attention to that. So I think we should always distinguish between people who are selling uh, just inspiration and a vision or whatever from people who are seriously trying to forecast. And we've always had that difference. But, you know, that's always been true for all areas of intellectual life. <laughs> At any one time, if you just pick random people who might make money telling people about their physics visions, <laughs> those people could make a lot of mistakes about physics in the way that somebody who carefully studies physics for decades won't. So, so that was predicting when technologies would arrive. Uh, what about predictions about the social implications? Is, is there any track record that we know of about that? I don't know of a more formal data set, but I know of a lot of good examples. So early in the dot-com boom, uh, there was this book called Information Rules put out by Varian and Shapiro. And their stick was, you know, we've been studying industrial organization for many decades <laughs> and uh, we can apply our standard theories to this new dot-com world. People in the dot-com world have been saying all the old rules are gone. There's a whole new world and the old rules don't apply. And that's just wrong. We'll just tell you what the old rules say about this new world. And they got an awful lot right. <laughs> there was a perfectly reasonable analysis of the new internet world from the point of view of applying all the standard old analysis rules about industrial organization. And that, that's a model that I think should be emulated. Just take all your standard old rules and see what they say. 
So, yeah, whether futurism actually works or not is is pretty important for us because, uh, as you know, we're, we're particularly concerned about the potential downsides of, of new technologies, you know, how, how these things could accidentally be used to make the world worse and tr- trying to foresee that and then prevent it from happening. And if it is possible to predict things, you know, many decades out, then that would suggest that maybe we should be actively trying to, you know, prepare for problems that could appear in decades out. If, if, if the track record of futurism is really quite bad, then we might want to focus only on like what bad things might happen in the next couple of years that might be more possible to, to foresee. What, what, what do you think about that? Do you think people who are trying to, you know, change the future should be thinking more long term or more short term? Well, uh, first, I'd say, you know, the track record of people who are serious and can be distinguished as being serious and careful is a lot better than the track record of people who just sell inspiring books or tell stories. So there is a track record there to go on. I think that first you need to study an area and work out its broad outlines before you get too far into figuring out all the things that could go wrong. So I think about it in terms of a distribution of outcomes. You should be first focused on guessing roughly the middle of the distribution of outcomes, (laughs) roughly the typical case And as you have a clearer vision of the typical case, then you can start to think about all the extreme tail event cases. The tails of a distribution in a high dimensional space are just a lot more detailed than the middle of the distribution. It's just a lot harder to work out the tails and figure out which ones are how interesting. Of course, but it's still valuable to think about the tails, but after you've gotten a broad idea of the center. So my book, The Age of M, primarily focuses on getting the typical case right about a world of brain emulations. And of course, even after a whole book, and I've got a revised version of the book coming out in a few months, there's still a lot I haven't thought about, but I still think there's enough there now that you could start to think about the tales of the distribution in that case and ask what are the things that could most go wrong in that world. I think before you had you know, something approaching the level of detail in those books, you were just in a much worse position trying to guess what were the important tales. Okay, because I was going to say, you might not want to think just about the most likely case, but, you know, have a particular focus on the cases where there's, you know, especially large upsides or downsides, or that you might be able to have a larger influence over over how things go. But are you saying it's important to understand the kind of the baseline most likely scenario? Even if you want to understand the tales, you have to do that first so that you have a, a picture of what you're dealing with. Yeah, if you, if you think back as the Industrial Revolution was just getting started, and you look at the fears that people had back then about our world, you know, there were pretty dramatical and emotionally potent fears that they had. I'm not sure how well they targeted the actual main risks of the industrial world. Uh, I think the more that you had understood the typical case in our industrial world, the more you could have thought about the main actual risks we faced. So in the early years, they were really focused on the fact that industry was more regimented than the world had been before. They had seen factories and even slave camps where life was very regimented. Not only did they tell you what time to work at which factory slot and and what what arm to use to do which twist, but in the stories, at least, they were imagining that they told you who to marry and when to eat and what color clothes to wear, and they imagined the entire world became very regimented, and that was the main fear that people presented about the industrial world well before we saw a lot of the detail. And those fears were somewhat misplaced. (laughs) Uh, that is, we, we have become much more regimented at work. We are much more structured and, and we are told what to do and have status ranking much more than our ancestors would have tolerated. But because we're rich, we don't do all that stuff outside of work, <laughs> even though we could have much more efficient homes and food and clothing, et cetera, if we did them all in a very structured, regimented way. We're rich enough to afford to do it some other way, which we do. Well, what do you think really were the, the biggest ris- risks from industrialization? Well, you know, as we look back now, we might concerned that industrialization would destroy the environment. We might be concerned of extremely powerful weapons that could uh, destroy the world. We might be concerned of, of a you know global government uh, taking over the world and that might be hostile to others. Those were and still are reasonable concerns about the industrial world. Hmm. Do, do you think it was a systematic reason why uh, people at the time focused more on the regimentation rather than those other concerns? Well, it was just, it was the most emotionally potent <laughs> one that stood out I mean, it was the one that, you know, in terms of the axis of control, which is a very standard axis in in, in fear and fiction, domination and submission is just an overwhelming obsession in fiction in terms of negative scenarios. Uh, People have always been overwhelmingly focused with the scenario of some of them dominating us and making us do it their way. And so that was the focus of the regimentation. The government would take over, the the factories would take over, the companies would take over, and they'd make us do things their way, whether we liked it or not. Hmm. Do, do you think we suffer from that same mistake today? Like maybe people are worried too much about, you know, Google taking, t- becoming too big a company and, and not enough about other issues? Uh, yes, I do, <laughs> actually. So, I mean, a basic fact about long-term trajectory is that uh, we organizations have slowly been getting larger and more 
coordination has been happening at larger and larger scales. So various functions of government, for example, have moved up from neighborhood to city to state, to nation, etc. Uh, as we get better at coordinating and our firms have gotten larger, people who work at large firms tend to be more innovative. They make more money. You know, large firms have just lots of advantages and plausibly large firms are in fact the main cause of the industrial revolution. They're the main thing that was different from before the industrial revolution. So we should be celebrating our large organizations, but in fact, we usually criticize them and, and futurists often have the hope that somehow now we'll finally get away from the big companies and we'll start to have small agile startups as the future. <laughs> People like to present <laughs> small agile startups as the future, but we're, we're just actually getting less and less of them over time because in fact, the long-term trend is toward large, more effective organizations organizations, not small, agile startups. So pre presumably you would accept that, that, that there could be some downsides to having, you know, uh, a small number of very large companies, because I guess it creates like a, uh, a smaller number of like very serious, like potential failure points where, where if these very big companies make bad decisions, it could have worse results. So you, you're a bit less diversified, but, but you just think that the gains are also potentially very large and, and people are kind of biased against them because these are kind of big, scary organizations that we don't really understand and don't, don't really trust because they're, they're just outside the human scale. Yeah, I would actually say the, the more the risk is that we are integrated at a global scale. Uh, if, if we broke the world into three different regions, each of whom was independent, <laughs> you know, then if any one re region crashed, the other two could continue on. We aren't doing that. We, we are basically having integrated global economies where each thing is happening mainly at some place in the world. And if that fails, then the rest of the world doesn't get it. It's less about one company taking over any one industry and just that industries are specialized at a global scale. Uh, that's more the fundamental risk that's causing us to all be dependent on each other more. And I can see a, I can see a reason for concern about that. Uh, if we worldwide become more correlated and interdependent, then something could take us all down together. It being one big company is less plausible than just the interdependence. So one other way that you think we can predict the future wrong is uh, this, this near versus far mode distinction, that, that people can think about things that uh, seem distant and in the future uh, in, in quite a different way than they think about you know, the world that they actually live in and that that can change their perception. Do, do you want to explain that? So this is my just learning about an area of psychology that I find to be potent and insightful and just trying to apply it and tell people about it. Uh, I didn't do any work in this area. I just read about it and I've been keeping track of it. And in fact, when I emailed the people who have done work in this area, I never got any replies. So I'm not like in this world. <laughs> I'm just talking about it, but I still think it's powerful to see. And so the main observation was actually first noticed in reasoning about the future. So in future analysis really shows this effect to a very strong degree. We have two extreme modes of reasoning in a continuum in, in between. Uh, the theory is called construal level theory, uh, and by level they mean abstract versus concrete. So we can either think about things very abstractly, or we can think about things very concretely. And there's a whole bunch of cues that induce us to one direction or the other. So when we think about things far away in space or time, uh, we know less detail about them, and so we think about them more abstractly. We also think about things more abstractly when they're far away in social distance, when they are more hypothetical, also when they are more focused on abstract general values versus practical constraints on decisions. These are contexts where we think more in what I'll call far mode. Conversely, uh, the more we think about something very close to us in space or social distance or time, a uh, very typical case, the more we will think about it in near mode. Uh, in near mode, we see things as having a lot of detail and that their categories they're in aren't so important as all the little details. So we, do, we expect a lot of deviation of each case from the typical average for its category. And we expect in any one set of items, the items are more diverse and varied from one another. And when we're making a decision, we expect it to be complicated and hard to apply fundamental value principles to. Uh, conversely, if we are thinking in far mode about things far away, we think there's less relevant detail. We focus more on the general features of the category. We think items in the category have, are, are more uniform uh, and we apply basic value principles more directly and, and are less willing to tolerate exceptions. We not only invoke them by these abstract things, but if you're you know, standing in a space that is physically larger and hear more echoes, you will be in more of a far mode. If you look out into the distance and see that things farther away are more blue, then blue puts you more in far mode and red puts you more in near mode. So there are actually classic futurist style is, is predicted by far mode. That is classic futurist visual style has more blue or shiny. Uh, surfaces have less texture. There are fewer surfaces in the image. Everyone wears the same thing. 
exactly. The, in the future, they all wear the same uniform. They're all the same. And then in the future, of course, they're they're very focused on their fundamental values, and they and we don't tolerate much exception for, about the app values. And uh, you know, and the music is echoey and ethereal. <laughs> and uh, in far mode, we're also just less emotionally intense, more reflective, and less passionate. Uh, near mode red is more passion and desire. And so, for example, lust is near and love is far. Because <laughs> lust is more, you know, in the passion with the detail and less attention to moral constraints, whereas love is more thinking about the values and the... Idealized. Yeah. Right, exa- exactly. Uh, what, what are some ways that this uh, kind of far mode can be, can be dangerous when we're thinking about trying to, trying to influence the future? I, I guess it means that we're like not focused enough on like specifically how you might accomplish things and what, what challenges you might face along the way, because it's, it's just all too... To abstract and you imagine that it's just a question of whether people are good or bad? So as you indicated about futuristic movies, we'll tend to assume that there's a small number of categories and items in each category are very uniform compared to the others. So for example, we might think there's a small number of classes, you know, like Wells's description of the future where there's the two classes above ground and below ground. And, you know, they're very distinct and inside of them, they're very uniform. Uh, and so you know, whatever theories you have, you're, very, you're confident in them in terms of how they apply to each case. You're overconfident. Uh, so you should just be less confident about your theories and how they apply. You should expect more categories and more variety inside each one, uh, including for categories of people. And you should expect that it's not so easy to apply your fundamental moral principles to their cases. <laughs> and, and you should be a little more tolerant of their variation. Plausibly, uh, this whole capacity of having a near mode and a far mode helps us to be naturally hypocritical. That is... When we look at ourselves in our current situation, in our moment of lust, for example, we see a lot of complexity and detail, and, and fundamental moral principles seem less useful than all the uh, practical details. But when we look at other people doing other things <laughs> at other times and places, we are more inclined to impose our basic value principles and to be intolerant of exceptions. So <laughs> that is, we apply our moral rules more strictly to other people in other places than we do to ourselves right now which basically allows us to be more hypocritical, but in a very natural way that we don't even notice. So like, how does this matter outside of futurism? I, I'm imagining, I, I guess, like when we're thinking about, you know, politics and other countries and, and the big picture things, we, we also tend to, we, we, we lose track of the details. Yes, or even politics in our country, right? Politics is a big picture thing. And so in politics, we do get more far mode and less in near mode. So we pay too much attention to values, I would say, in politics and in futurism. That's one of the mistakes. So if you think about any practical decision you're about to make in the next hour, you'll know, of course, that values and facts are relevant to every decision you make. You need to know facts and you need to know values. But in most practical decisions you're about to make, the facts are more important. You'll pay a lot more attention to the details of the facts and you'll mostly assume background values that are not changing that much from case to case. Uh, however, the farthest you get up into thinking of grand world or national politics or farther into the future, you will switch the emphasis and you will focus a lot more on values than you will on facts. So I've certainly noticed that when people start to talk about almost any futurism issue, they, they immediately try to talk about values and they don't spend very much time talking about facts. What's, what's, what's an example of that? What would they say that's about values? Well, we, we could talk about AI risk if you like. Uh, people don't take very much time to think about uh, the actual facts about AI risk. Uh, they, they quickly discuss whether they value various kinds of AI and AI scenarios. They are, they are eager to talk about their preferences over various scenarios and what they would prefer, rather than thinking about which scenarios are how likely and have what probability and what structure. And, and so that's a consistent issue, but it's also true for, say, thinking about world government uh, or even you know other big materialism. Uh, people quickly talk about their values. So even for something like global warming, uh, people will quickly focus on their values about global warming. Are we too materialistic? Are we not coordinating up at a global level? Uh, and they will focus less on the concrete facts about uh, which regions will be heated too much or have too much weather change or which plants, et cetera, will suffer. I mean, maybe does that make sense, just given the fact that it's it's much harder to come up with concrete facts about things that are going to happen you know, further in the future and you know, other countries that you don't understand very well? You just don't have many facts to go on. So instead, you kind of default to what you do know, which is like what you like. Well, that's why I wrote The Age of M, <laughs> right. to say that you could say a lot of detail. So people have told me that it's too much detail. It's not as fun. I, I should have just had less detail in the book, and then people could finish reading the book quicker. But I, my priority was to show just how much detail I could say. 
So uh, I've tried to prove, and I, and I will continue to try to do related projects to show that, in fact, you can show a lot of detail about these future scenarios. It's available if you'll bother to work on it. Hmm. Do, do you think that construal level theory is part of the reason that people tend to think that their political opponents are bad people rather than just, say, misinformed? It's part of it. I think it's also part of why we disagree. So I have some research on the nature of uh, sort of rational disagreement and why people disagree. And I also think that uh, when we see our own arguments and details up close, uh, we feel differently about that. And when we think abstractly about other people, uh, we abstractly know they must have some sort of arguments and reasons for their beliefs, but we just find it hard to give enough credence to their really being there and, and uh, being as complicated and, and thought out as our own. Um, so yes, I, I do think construal of a theory says a lot about many cases where we are thinking differently about things far away from us to things up close. Hmm. Well, we haven't been able to do the, the Age of M justice here. We don't, we don't ha quite have time, but uh, I'll maybe find a, a good interview or a good summary of, of the book or perhaps an excerpt that, that we can link people to if they're interested in, in learning more. Uh, I, th I think it really does uh, demonstrate that you're right, that you, 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 can, you can map out particular scenarios, I guess, even if you're not exactly sure which scenario is going to happen. So I, I got to say that a lot of the people that we know in common, you know, like the fact that the book is there and they praise me for writing it, but I get relatively little engagement of the details of the book. <laughs> people don't seem very interested in talking about the details of the scenario. They are focused on other sort of grand, higher abstract issues, I guess. And so, you know, that's a, a way in which people are abstract. I mean, it, it's hard, Robin. It's hard. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. But I mean, you could just like critique it or say which parts you thought were more plausible, or less plausible, or where, where did I make a mistake, or what parts should we elaborate more detail on that we haven't elaborated so far. And uh, I, I, again, I think a lot of people in this futurism and altruism space, are, they like to be really abstract. I think, as I've said, I actually think one of the most common elements that, that's in common with the people we know that's different from other people if you want to say what's the one factor explanation, I think it's a taste for abstraction. A taste for abstraction predicts the taste for discussing altruism and abstract ethics, also other kinds of abstraction in terms of decision theory or quantum mechanics. So a taste for abstraction is what many of the people we know have in common, and that means they, they really qu lose interest quickly in getting into details. So many people abstractly think prediction markets are a great idea, but aren't really interested in getting into the details of making them work in particular organizations. They might be interested in the abstract issues of the future in terms of broad category, but they're less interested in picking a scenario and working out its details. And uh, I think it's fine for people who are more abstract to do more abstract things, but if most of the people in an area are more abstract, then the more concrete things will get neglected. And I think that is happening. So it sounds like you think maybe the effective altruism community should, should really try to attract some people who are perhaps a bit less abstract who can put things into practice. Right. Now, this is related to the youth movement factor because, in fact... <laughs> It is easier early in life to focus on abstraction and easier later in life to focus on, on concrete details. Uh, there, there is a literature, for example, on fields where the people who made the biggest contributions made some sort of conceptual reorganization and fields where the people who made the biggest contribution sort of integrated a lot of detail over a long time. And those second fields, the people were at an older age when they made their biggest contributions. And so I think that's a problem with having a field you know, dominated by young people as they will then focus on the abstractions and then neglect the details until later in life when they get older. Hmm. Well, uh, we're running out of time, so let's move away from talking about these specific books to talking about books in the abstract. So over the course of your career, I guess, um, when you were an early academic, I suppose you mostly published papers, and, and then you started writing this uh, the, the blog, Overcoming Bias, that uh, ended up with a pretty large audience. And just recently, you've, you've written two books all of a sudden. What, what do you feel is, is, is the best outlet for your ideas? Which, which one has actually managed to promote them a lot? And what, was it worth the switching to, to writing books, even though it's a bit more challenging? Well, the main reason to publish papers was to get tenure. <laughs> Tenure is this prize that gives you decades worth of free time to study whatever you want. It's, it's an enormously valuable prize. There's a lot of competition for it, but still you should be tempted to grab that prize, especially if you're younger than I was. I, I've lost some of the prize because I got it later in life, which means I don't get to use it for as many decades. Uh, but still, I've been using it and enjoying it. So early in life, uh, you're more of a seller than a buyer. So people tend to think of themselves in buyer mode when they're thinking about it, their intellectual life. That is, what ideas would I like to buy? What research would I like to buy? Early on, you're a seller. You have to think, what do other people want to buy? What could I sell that they would be willing to buy? If you can sell enough, then you can perhaps get tenure. 
or some sort of established position, and then you can be more of a buyer. Then you can focus on what you want. And uh, so I focused on publishing papers primarily because that's what sold. That's what I could sell to others. Um, and then the rise of blogging happened to coincide with my getting tenure. And so that was tempting to switch to blogging because uh, basically, many published papers, the contribution could fit in four paragraphs of text. <laughs> they have to fill it out to be a long paper and do a lot of complicated things to impress people. But the key in intellectual insight can be explained in a few paragraphs. So it's tempting to just write a few paragraphs and add to the intellectual world of contributions. Uh, and so I was tempted by that, to, especially to find the low-hanging fruit, the things you insights you could get in a, in a day's work and a few paragraphs of explanation. And uh, I spent a few years... Uh, following that path of just thinking about things and getting some insights and explaining them in a blog post. And then the, the, the switch to books? Yeah, so then I decided that blog posts won't last as long. And what if I want to have a legacy? What if I want to sort of have a longer impact? There's a problem that, uh, so for example, many newspaper columns are read by 100,000 people, but most of them will read it, nod their head, and do nothing with it. Yeah, and then it's very hard to access in future. Right. So if you want to have a legacy, if you, you want people to build on your work, so it's not enough just to have people read it. You want people to get excited and interested enough that they might build on what you've done. So somebody who wrote a journal article for an academic journal might only get 10 people reading their article, but three of them might build on it, which is a, quite a temptation, even if it's a very small audience. So a key question about your intellectual contribution is not just how much space will it take to explain and how many people will I get to read is, but how will I get the people who might actually build on it and accumulate more insight to read and build on it? What does that take? So that takes not just explaining it clearly, it also takes some sort of credential for it that it is an important thing and worth noting. And so that's what journals and books do is they add that sort of credential. Now, books have weaker peer review in the sense that at least in my area, in journals, you submit an article to a journal, and even if referees like it, they will ask you to make a whole bunch of changes just because they can. <laughs> and it'll take you years to make all those changes and get it accepted and finally get out uh, into the journals. Books, there's less of that sort of, you know, refer referees editing your book for you. <laughs> you can more write the book you wanted. And also, the size of, of a unit, uh, depend, you know, is related to how different an idea you need to explain. In four paragraphs, you really can't explain a very radical idea. Uh, it has to be pretty close to some other ideas that you've already explained or somebody else has already explained. Uh, there's just not enough space. You can explain a more radical idea in a 20-page paper, although if you have to like have a lot of rigor in terms of your method and everything else, there's still not that much space, but there can be more. A book is a place where you can really explain an idea that is big and will take a whole book to explain and persuade somebody of. And that's the kind of books that I've been trying to write and the books I prefer to read. Uh, I, I do have a lot of you know, more radical, big ideas that I want to get out there. And I do fear that a blog post, certainly, and even a journal article, are just not enough space to, to make a case for it, to really convince a reader. And so this book that we've just been talking about, The Elephant in the Brain, I think is an example of that. Uh, so my colleague, Brian Kaplan, has a book on the case against education. And he's taken a whole book to focus on the one topic of education. And I fear that education analysts and researchers look at his book and say, well, he's put a lot of evidence together and made a plausible case. But even so, his initial hypothesis is so implausible that we just can't believe it. Because uh, you know, there's just the usual way of thinking about things. And then there's this weird alternative way that it's just hard to take seriously. And so I think the contribution of our book, The Elephant in the Brain, is to show that that same sort of thing applies to lots of areas. And seeing that all together in one book could convince you that there's a lot of that going on in the way that one book on one of those things couldn't. And that's an example of how a book can be needed to make a point that you couldn't really make in a sequence of articles. So, I mean, has it been a success? Have the books helped to get your ideas taken more seriously and get other people to take them up? We're still pretty early, too early to tell, as I guess uh, Deng Xiaoping or somebody once said about the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> so, I, think, I, think it, I think it was some riots in France. Oh, no, it was the French Revolution, is that right? French, French Revolution, that's right. Yeah. So one key problem is that I, I hadn't realized that this is really about a disagreement between disciplines. Psychologists on one side and policy analysts on the other. So the book has been classified as psychology. Uh, so a psychology editor took it along and they had psychology referees evaluate it, seven of them, all of whom thought it was great. And then uh, psychologists have been the ones to write reviews of the book. And they also think, of course, it's true and even imply 
but this isn't very new, so you know, is it really worth having a book about something that's really kind of repetition? Was what everybody else has said. That's from the psychologist's point of view, but from the policy analyst's point of view, as again Brian Kaplan is experiencing, people are pretty uh, reluctant to believe the claim that in their particular area we have hidden motives that are substantially important there. So policy analysts really disagree with the psychologists about the plausibility of hidden motives in many of these policy areas. So. I would like the, the book to engage that disagreement, but so far it's only the psychologists who have thought they should engage the book who mostly agree with it, and I have so far largely failed to get the policy people to respond. Why, why do you think they're, they're reluctant to accept this? I suppose, well, in the case of doctors, you know, saying that people aren't using medicine to, to get healthy is it's understandable. But if you're a healthcare policymaker, why, why would you be resistant to this idea? Well, I, I did experience this, like as, as I said before, when I wrote the uh, Cato Unbound essay on cut medicine in half. So there were a number of health policy people who responded there. And I think if you spend your life in health policy, uh, health is somewhat sacred to you. <laughs> Similarly, if you spend your life doing education policy, education is somewhat sacred to you. It's, it's an important, precious thing that you've devoted your life to. And so it's really hard to see it deflated that much. Similarly, if you are, if you are religious, <laughs> you know, thinking of religion as a relatively cynical thing is also pretty hard. Or if you're really into politics, thinking of politics as, as mostly about personal loyalty as opposed to making for better policy, that's also kind of hard to swallow. And so consistently, when people have an area of life they've devoted themselves to, it tends to be hard to swallow the idea that that whole area of life is just not nearly as important as people say. So you, you published your first book fairly late in your career. Do, do you wish that you'd started writing books earlier? Did you think that then you would have more time to get more of these ideas out there in a really thorough way? I'm not sure. Uh, that's a reasonable critique. Certainly, some of my colleagues thought I should have written a prediction market book much earlier, as soon as prediction markets became a thing back right after the policy analysis market blew up in the press. Uh, and I could have been wrong, you know. The, the, but the biggest thing that you know caused the long delay is my not getting my PhD started till the age of 34. And so you can imagine a whole decade uh, gained by pushing that back. The price there was that I wasn't very sure of what was the most important subject to study, and I searched across subjects. And I finally think I made a good choice. If I had made that choice well initially, of course, that would have been better. But of course, if I had made a bad choice initially, it would have been worse. <laughs> so it's hard for me to really say whether I made a mistake there or not. Well, uh, let's talk about what advice you might have for uh, you know listeners who are who are earlier in their earlier in their career. Has it hurt you to, to change fields so much? And especially, I guess especially to be such a generalist. I mean, academics are known for specializing in just one thing, but it seems like you've just ranged across across everything. It's, it's almost amazing that you've managed to actually become an academic. So I got lucky, I'll have to admit. So uh, about the time tenure review came up here at George Mason, uh, I had just been in the press recently with this policy analysis market explosion. So basically, a project I was involved in uh, to study prediction markets for defense policy blew up in the press where some senators accused us of having markets in terrorist attacks and betting on terrorist attacks. That isn't what we were doing, but the accusation was enough to kill the project. And then for a few years, there was a lot of discussion. Uh, the next day after these senators accused us of having this, uh, Secretary of Defense in front of Congress uh, declared the project was killed and senator, other senators, including Hillary Clinton at the time, denounced it as a terrible, immoral thing. And uh, be because they were denouncing it in part because it was a market and betting on uh, death and terrorist attacks, my colleagues here at George Mason, who are relatively pro-free market, took my side. <laughs> they saw me as uh, fighting the good fight against the other ignorant folks out there, and therefore I kind of got tenure. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's not like they couldn't have given me time, but there, there's usually a lot of discretion in terms of how much is enough. They never announce a simple formula because they want to have the discretion. And so uh, they use that discretion in my case to give me tenure uh, because I had pissed off senators. <laughs> so, so I got lucky. So that's a part of the explanation for how I succeeded is I got lucky. It's not the only thing, of course. I, I, it wouldn't have worked if I had not produced anything of interest. I also think that once you get tenure, there's just a lot more freedom to be a generalist. Now, you might say that I was a generalist before I got tenure, which is partly true, but I did focus enough to have a body of research that they could give me credit tenure for. Uh, but, you know, I was managing to, to restrain my generalist tendencies for a while while I tried to get tenure. That's the focusing on selling rather than buying. Did you find it hard to motivate yourself to do that? Well, uh, I guess, yes, <laughs> but I succeeded. <laughs> I mean, it is on the margin. So I actually think... I mean, this is relevant for most listeners who may be sort of wannabe intellectual academics. Academia rewards you for focusing on one thing and being really good at one thing much more than is the natural inclination of most humans. 
most of us, in, when in our free time, we want to think and be an intellectual. We want to be more general. And so people who are intellectuals as, as a you know, leisure activity, they are pretty general. They read on a lot of different topics and think about a lot of topics. Even when they focus, they don't focus remotely as much as a, a successful academic needs to focus. So if you want to become a successful academic, you will need to focus more than you are inclined because you are selling to a world that wants you to be that focused. Uh, you can realize that, uh, you know, just like with any job, you're allowed to have a hobby. You could pers- you could spend 25% of your time on your hobby, but as long as you spend the other 75% on your job, you may well like do your job well enough. And later on, you will have a lot more freedom after you get tenure. So it's a great prize to go for. So you've dived into kind of a lot of different topics over the course of your career. Uh, are there any kind of research agendas that you'd be really enthusiastic to see listeners uh, pick up the mantle on, which which haven't already come up? <laughs> Well, I've tried to mention them so far. <laughs> I, I'm really excited about the possibility of prediction markets and, and decision markets, and I think there's enormous potential there. I think there's a lot of potential for a lot of other related innovations in uh, policy, uh, various ways we could change law, uh, change zoning, uh, change medical purchases, etc. There's just enormous potential there, but we just haven't done very much to actually uh, improve things. Uh, I, I, of course, uh, think there's a lot of potential in analyzing the future by defining particular technology scenarios and working at the social consequences. If you can learn a lot of fields and and just methodically apply all the standard tools, I think we can say a lot. And the the elephant in the brain, uh, I think there's huge potential in just continuing to apply this idea that there are hidden motives to lots of other areas. We did 10 areas in the book, but you could do another 20 or 30 uh, and find a lot of hidden motives elsewhere as well. Uh, one one thing I didn't follow up on earlier that I that I should have is you were saying that just psychologists kind of read the elephant in the brain and they almost yawn because this is just such common sense to them. Yeah, basically. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have been pushing back as though this was such a controversial idea if it's just <laughs> the mainstream consensus among psychologists, but not among policy people. So there are a lot of disagreements across disciplines, and in fact, there's some of the least excusable disagreements we have in academia. <laughs> So within any one subfield, if there are disagreements, they usually hammer it out. Now, they might might hammer it out unfairly. They might squash a view that deserves more attention. But in fact, they will, in fact, come to a consensus within a small area where people talk to each other a lot. That's quite consistent. And so the rest of the world will see a consistent consensus within each area. But they don't coordinate nearly as well on much larger scales. (laughs) Uh, you know, we don't have any process for saying what are the fields that people should be studying and how much money should go into them. We, we mostly just have a process where we just continue on funding whatever fields have been funded, even if you know other fields think they're not very useful. And when fields disagree with each other across boundaries, we mostly just ignore that. So, for example, large areas of literature, they really hate economists. They, they just think we're evil. <laughs> yeah. And we economists just go on ignoring their critique. We, we, we just don't engage. Do, do, do economists think that literature analysts are evil? No, no. We, we, we think literature is fine, although you know, we might think it's not scientific enough or something, I mean, perhaps, but we certainly don't hate them. And, and there are many other areas where people think e- economists are evil and just shouldn't be doing what they're doing, and but we just ignore them and go on our way. And so there's a, a failure of engagement there. And again, our book, The Elephant in the Brain, is about a failure to engage a disagreement between policy people and psychologists. Psychologists think, yes, of course, if humans have hidden motives. We aren't pretty honest about why we do things. And the, and the policy people say, yes, of course, school is about learning. Medicine is about health. Are you crazy? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> isn't it obvious? <laughs> And even if there's a bunch of data that we don't understand, we must just, we need to continue to puzzle over this data and collect more data so that eventually, presumably, the usual explanation will win. (laughs) There's just a a strong reluctance to really ever accept a very contrary conclusion on the basis of, you know, not infinite data. Hmm. So, yeah, speaking of which, I mean, Throughout your career, you've been pushing ideas or trying to trying to get ideas taken seriously that people might regard as kind of strange and uh, not really credible. Uh, what have you learned about how to get your ideas taken seriously by the people who need to take them seriously? Oh, I, I don't know that I have learned that. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have gotten the right people to take these things seriously. Uh, you know, certainly one standard, uh, pretty obvious advice is, uh, you know, pay your dues and collect the standard sort of credentials, you know. It's going to be very hard to get people to take your contrarianism seriously if you haven't taken their field seriously. That is, go into some fields, learn their standard stuff, gain their credentials, show them that you understand their way of thinking, and then they might listen to you if you say that they are wrong and you should think about things differently. 
Uh, unless you gain some credibility somewhere, it'll be very hard to do that. Now, unfortunately, there's a sense in which different fields have different status and people often just listen to the field with the highest status as opposed to the people who actually study something more detail. So like physics is pretty high in the status ranking of uh, academic fields. And so if you're at a party and a subject comes up, physicists usually feel free to just like make up whatever thought comes to the top of their head. <laughs> and most people will kind of nod sage sagely uh, because, hey, they're the physicist. And, you know, that's kind of a problem, of course. But, you know, obviously, if you want to be a contrary, just collect some credentials. I mean, th that is the main thing I'm, I would say, the elephant in the brain. Academia is mostly about credentialing impressiveness that people can associate with. That's mainly what it focuses on. So that, that could also help explain many of its failures. <laughs> you should be more willing to believe that academia is wrong when it's the, you know, the explanation for why it's wrong is it just neglects something because it's hard to be impressive there because academia does do that. Academia will neglect just very simple qualitative arguments for something, uh, even if they're solid qualitative arguments uh, in favor of complicated math and, you know, big computers and et cetera. Well, what's, what's a nice example of that? Well, I would say the age of M, for example, is uh, very low tech. <laughs> Uh, and uh, even the elephant in the brain here is pretty low tech. And most of the blog posts I think I've ever written that had insight in them were relatively low tech. And for the most part, academia doesn't disagree with them. They just look at that and say, well, you couldn't publish that in a top journal, so what's the point? It's just like doesn't exist really from their point of view because it's not the sort of thing that could win their status games. Mm. So speaking of contrarianism, I think it's fair to say that a couple of times over the over the years, you've kind of enjoyed uh, rallying people up a little bit, you know, ma making controversial arguments and, and enjoying the attention and the, and the disagreement that that gets. Do, do you think that's a that's a good approach to take? Because maybe, maybe it draws more attention to, to your ideas. Or do, do you think maybe that the downsides outweigh the upsides because, you know, people end up not liking your ideas or you? Well, a lot depends on how you would rile people up. I mean, I certainly wouldn't approve of just insulting people, saying nanny nanny and, you know, your mom wears ar army pants or, you know, whatever you might do to just taunt somebody into replying. I, I, I don't think I would ever do that. But I think, you know, the information value about out of any particular thing you might say is proportional to the scope of what you say and inversely proportional to the a priori probability people would have given. So. The more you can find something that people would have assigned a low probability to, the more that has a high information value if they if you can convince it of them. So I think it's completely reasonable to focus on finding the things that people would be the most surprised to hear and telling them that. That's a completely reasonable strategy for identifying valuable research. When you find something that people would have, you know, assigned a low probability to, uh, you need to make that clear. You need to make it clear and direct that they would have assigned a low probability to this in the absence of your arguments or analysis. Is that a good idea? Like m maybe you just want to make it seem as, as common sense as, as possible. And I, I, my impression, like reading your writing over the years is that you've you started to do that more and more, that in the, in the past you used to kind of highlight the ways that the ideas you're promoting were, were counterintuitive, whereas now I think you, you're happier to make them seem quite mundane. I mean, you do want to make the argument seem as persuasive as possible. So, I mean, there's two ends. On the one hand, you're, you're saying something they're surprised by, which is why it's valuable. On the other hand, when they read their argument, it should be as obvious and persuasive as possible. It should both lead to a conclusion that would have been surprising and, you know, in the context of the argument, be hard to disagree with. That That's the ideal thing you're going for. You, you want exactly both of those. Uh, but in order to, you know, highlight the importance of what you're saying, you need to highlight that, in fact, they didn't expect this, that, in fact, <laughs> this is a surprise. Otherwise, uh, uh, why is it interesting? Well, I think I think that is where the problem comes in because I I have seen there's some people I know who are very good at taking things that people might object to uh, or taking things that people might be very skeptical of and making them seem just extremely common sense. And, and I think that means that people, if you can get them to read the argument, are then more likely to accept it because you you increase the kind of their prior on it being true by framing it in such a way that it seems very natural, and then you show them ev more evidence that it that it's true. The problem is like you know, uh, arguments of that kind don't tend to get very much attention because <laughs> they're, 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 they're too boring and people don't object and people don't reply. And so you, you, they don't get shared very much. And, and that's that's like quite a deep dilemma, I think, uh, in terms of how information gets shared across the internet, that kind of almost the, the worse the, the argument or the like the, the more counterintuitive it is. And, and in, in a sense, the less likely it is to be true, the more likely you, people are to pass it on to others. So I think there is a status uh, correlation here. If, if you'll notice that people's first books are usually more controversial and contrarian than their later books. <laughs> that is, w once you achieve a status, then you can say something that people kind of mostly agree with and you can still get them to buy your book. <laughs> but your first book needs to stand out more as something they might disagree with. Uh, similarly, you know, when you are on the outs trying to like get attention and get tenure, you'll need to like 
make a stance that seems more likely. Once you're a high status Harvard professor or something, you can just repeat <laughs> trite truisms <laughs> and add the authority of being a Harvard professor onto it, and people will accept that as a contribution. So in fact, people at the highest status, they, they do tend to be very uh, confirming what you would have expected, but supposedly doing it with more rigor and care and data or something. And it's people who aren't at that level and can't just get attention by confirming what people think who have to say something more surprising to get attention. Of course, there's everything depends on whether you say something surprising that's true or not, of course. <laughs> but one strategy to get attention by saying something surprising is just to say something crazy yeah, and, and not have your audience know that it's crazy or that your evidence doesn't really support it. So that, that is the trick, <laughs> to, to say something surprising and have a solid argument for it. And that's where I hope I'm trying to stand out, not just saying something that's contrarian or or riling people up, but also having that solid argument for it. Yeah, I, I, I guess that helps to explain a bit why kind of the strident contrarianism seems to be more common, I think, among younger people, because they've got to find a way to make a name for themselves. And one way to do that is to say things that are interesting and wrong. <laughs> right. They do have to stand out. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's worth looking at people's books and their first book and seeing which were how, you know, which had more surprise and disagreement. And I think people's first you know, main book that gave them their fame uh, tends to be more controversial, tends to have stronger claims that people would disagree with. Mm. Well, what have you changed your mind about over the over the last five years? Over the last five years? Hmm. Uh, well, I could say that, well, I mean, I've certainly changed my mind that uh, blockchain can cause a splash, because <laughs> it has, and, and I was initially not terribly uh, optimistic about it, but there it is, making a splash. I, you know, certainly didn't predict Trump or the increasing uh, attention. I... Uh, Noticed that we had been at a peak of uh, global and historical political polarization a few years ago and therefore predicted regression in the mean. <laughs> but we haven't regressed to the mean yet. <laughs> we are still moving away from it. So I still got to predict regression to the mean, but hey, the momentum effects there. So I could, could go the other way for a little while. I got a, a grant funded by Open Philanthropy to uh, analyze a different future scenario in the same style of the age of M. And uh, that's a scenario that I, I thought I be, should be able to figure out something, but I wasn't really sure. And, and I've been pleased that I have been able to come up with some concrete conclusions about an alternative scenario. So that's something where I was surprised at the kind of conclusions I could draw. And uh, I'm pleased with that, I guess. Um, those are some of the surprises I might have. I guess uh, another surprise, well, I mean, I, I kind of always knew, but uh, I'm, I'm becoming increasingly discouraged by the fact that our usual like forums of argument just don't reward accurate argument very well. <laughs> you know, I, I read yeah, it's a it's a deep problem. <laughs> I, I read you know articles or reviews in the paper, and I say I know that these people know the counter arguments, <laughs> or they certainly could if they put a little effort, and, and they're just ignoring it because their audiences don't know it. And that's true in academia a lot too. That uh, people just don't have the incentive to make an argument that you know is robust against counter arguments when their audience won't know those counter arguments. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more and more discouraged wondering, like, OK, but <laughs> what can you do in the face of such things? That's why I was trying to design prediction markets as a solution to that. But we're not going to have that for a while. So I'm not sure what exactly one when exactly should one in, when you notice an argument that's just, you know, could easily be rebutted. Do you bother to rebut it? Because uh, life is short and there's so many things out there that could be rebutted. You know, I'm just not. I guess at some point you might just think, well, just find a thing you could say that you might get people to listen to that would be useful and say it and don't spend all your time rebutting people who, who won't reward you for pointing out the errors. Uh, can you think of any times when you really formed an, a really incorrect belief that you think you should have been able to realize was incorrect at the time? Well, the, the whole mistake at the beginning of my life of, of taking people at their word for their motives uh, on, on reflection is pretty uh, suspicious, right? <laughs> Economists tend to think of themselves as pretty cynical about people's motives, and they're not. They're actually pretty gullible like everybody else. You've been following the growth of the effective altruism movement for a while and you know, seeing, seeing what kind of new ideas we come up with. Uh, has it exceeded your expectations or fallen short of them? And I guess, what would you like to, to see us do differently if we could do one thing differently? What I tend to want to focus on is insight. Um, so when I hear people talk about effective altruism, I think, okay, if you're serious about being effective, you think about the question, you come up with some insights. So I want to know over time, what insights have people gotten? What, what are the key new insights that uh, people just hadn't realized before that you could say, this is what we've learned and here's what you should know. 
And to the extent that a field like effective altruism has collected those insights, my hat is off and I say, all right, that's the kind of intellectual progress I'm hoping for. <laughs> People open up a new area and they come up with insights and they share them and we all learn more and, uh, you know, the progress of uh, our intellectual world. And so this is the thing I would want to ask people in effective altruism, which is, okay, what have we learned? Because often what I've heard is the sort of thing I said, but we knew that already, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I want to know what we've learned. And that's the question I put to you or, the, or to that community. You know, please try to summarize what you've learned. What do we know now that we didn't know five years ago or 10 years ago that all your work has produced so we can say, you guys have done some work. It's not enough to have your heart in the right place and to be talking about an important topic. <laughs> That's the prerequisite of trying to find insight, but until you actually find insight, something you can pass on and say, this is what we've learned, you still kind of fail. So uh, we, we got to finish up because we've been going for, for a couple of hours now. But just a, just a final question. What, what's kind of changed about the world uh, since, since you're my age? Uh, have, have things gone, gone better or worse than, than you might have hoped? Well, I remember when I was your age or younger, I felt like I was this lone person uh, you know, without many other people who thought like I was. <laughs> I, I had subjects I was interested in, but uh, there weren't very many other people who took these big picture questions seriously. And now I can feel uh, that there's another generation or two out there <laughs> that even if they aren't focused on exactly what I would focus on are actually thinking about interesting questions. And it's, it's somewhat of, uh, of a, a tear come to my eye to know <laughs> that humanity will go on and continue to ask deep questions and make progress. Um, I love that. <laughs> My guest today has been Robin Hansen. Thanks for coming on the show, Robin. Great to be here. If you enjoyed that episode, you can hear more of Robin's ideas by visiting his blog, Overcoming Bias, or buying one of his two recent books. The 80,000 Hours Podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.